Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to day one of Scholars Portal Days 2023. Refresh, reframe, renew. Um, I just have a few housekeeping notes before we get started. First of all, this session is being recorded and the recordings will be shared um, after with, with everyone who attended today, um, as well as posted onto the Scholars Portal YouTube channel. We also have slides for today available on Spot Docs. Um, if you want to follow along with the slides, and I will just post that into the chat if you um, can uh, want to click on it. Um, we also have captions available uh, this morning um, if you want to um, use the captions, and you can click on the closed caption icon in the Zoom bar. Um, you can uh, use the um, chat to talk to fellow attendees, uh, make commentary on presentations, um, please be kind and respectful. If you would like to ask a question from the presenter, please use the Q&A module. So that's on your little black bar. Um, there's a little Q&A button. Um, you can use that to ask questions. You can also view questions that other people have asked and give them a little upvote if you would also like to see the answer to that question. If we don't get to any questions, we will be saving those questions later and distributing um, the answers in a written format to attendees. And um, the hashtag for Twitter, if you want to tweet about today's event, is hashtag SPDays23. Um, so we want to start with, with a, a short land acknowledgement um, about uh, the land where Scholars Portal operates. So the land where Scholars Portal operates and upon which most Scholars Portal staff live and work for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work and to live on this land. Um, we know we have people joining us from a wide geographic region today, so we do encourage you to reflect on the land from which you're joining us and uh, to add your own land acknowledgement in the chat. And if you aren't sure about the land that you're joining us from, we do have a resource um, for you uh, that might help, which I will also put a link to in the chat. So. Um, feel free to add your uh, your own land acknowledgement in the chat at this time. All right, so to kick us off today, I'm going to pass it over to um, the uh, former chairs of the OCL SP committee to make some opening remarks. Um, Ed Dreger from Nipissing University and Karen Pilon from the University of Windsor, who spent uh, many years as chairs of uh, co chairs of OCL SP, and um, we're really grateful to have had them um, work with us in that capacity and to have them here with us today. Thank you so much, Sabina. Thank you to everyone. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Scholars Portal Days. Ed and I are so happy to welcome you to this awesome event. I'm coming to you from the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, which includes the Ojibwe, the Adawa, and the Potawatomi peoples. As we refresh, reframe, and renew, let us also remember to refresh our hearts as we build awareness for the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Uh, the National Day of Recognition is tomorrow, so please wear red to show your support. Let us reframe our thinking about how the initiatives and work we will hear about today uh, take in with a lens of decolonization and renew our relationships with the Indigenous colleagues that we have at all of our institutions and in all of the lands by which we are on and the land that we work and play on. So each moment of this change represents an opportunity to reflect on what we do and how we do it and to learn from what's come before and consider how we can improve going forward. So Ed and I have been uh, the OCL SP co-chairs as, as Sabina has mentioned for many years now and we end our run as SP co-chairs. We want to give our appreciation to Andrew uh, Colgoni from Brock University and Lynn Service from McMaster University and all the members of SPOD, especially Beth for her leadership and in helping us work together with all the members of the OCL team. We'd like to bring our attention to the value, uh, your 
our attention to the value of a scholar's portal and OCL scholar's portal as a sounding board and strong and positive support as a strong and positive uh, support mechanism as we come out of more intensive COVID environments um, last fall. And we listen to our colleagues discuss their various plans to move out of the COVID environment. The group became a good place to share the concerns and bring solutions. So we're so thankful for this group for both giving information around scholars portal, but also being a sounding board for each other. Thanks, Karen, uh, for getting us started. I'm joining you this morning from the territory of uh, Nipissing First Nation, the territory of the Anishinaabek within lands protected by the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to work on and play on these beautiful and, and inspiring lands. As my share of our brief opening remarks, I'd like to highlight several of areas of work by Ogle SP within the past year as highlighted within the annual report to the directors. Uh, first off, Ogle SP, which is the Ogle Scholars Portal Standing Committee, met regularly throughout the year to support the Scholars Portal team, which is a key piece of what we need to do. And we did that by providing timely feedback on ongoing initiatives while also supporting new and ongoing projects. Ocal SP continues to offer a valuable forum for its members as a place to share institutional updates that relate to Scholars Portal and generate updates that lead to discussions on issues of shared concern and interest. One of the, the highlights from that annual report is the Shared Repository Infrastructure Working Group, which grew out of discussions at Ocal SP and has developed an excellent report on the state of institutional repository infrastructure at Ontario universities and Canada as a whole. And that all started back in the spring of 2021 um, from a suggestion from uh, Daniel Godon at uh, the University of Ottawa. And from there gradually grew to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, to an informal local SP survey in which 17 of 21 institutional local SP representatives expressed an interest in exploring the idea of a shared OCL repository infrastructure. And from that, at the request of OCL SP committee, the Scholars Portal Operations and Development Committee formed the Shared Repository Infrastructure Working Group that helps us inform, uh, helps to help the OCL directors inform a decision about whether to move ahead to the next phase in, the, in pursuing a shared repository as a project or a service within OCL. The members of the group were a mix of repository and IR librarians and AULs from OCL institutions, along with two scholars portal representatives. And the group developed an excellent report. Uh, I've just dropped the uh, link for that report into the chat. Um, and I'd strongly encourage anyone interested in the topic to review that. Uh, we look forward to this complex work continuing and seeing the results in the future. And as we move forward throughout these two days with all of you, we'd like to recognize the tireless work of the Scholars Portal Day Committee in putting this event together. This year, the committee was made up of our new OCL SP chairs, Andrew Calgoni from Brock, Lynn Service from uh, McMaster, Karen Pilon from Windsor, Sabina Pagato and Ginsley Mondazier from Scholars Portal, and Annika Irvin Ward and Katrina Fortner from the OCL office. Thank you to all. Uh, we couldn't do it if without a group such as that. In closing, we'd like to wish everyone a great Scholars Portal Day experience and hope that each of you are able to connect with the people and information that will be shared with you over the next two days. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I think I'm up next. So just uh, really briefly, um, uh, from me and all the Scholars Portal staff, a huge thank you uh, to Karen and Ed for all, all your just amazing work over the last couple of years as chair of OCL SP. Um, I, I think really, you know the the last couple of years that that committee has has really coalesced and and has has started to become such a such a critical part of the work that we do at Scholars Portal, and it's really I think it's really down to the kind of consistent and um, I don't know focused leadership that we had on the committee in the last couple of years. So thank you, thank you so much, and I also just wanted to um, just thank Sabina. 
probably everybody should <laughs> and the, for all her work in bringing this event together really um uh we couldn't we couldn't do it without you sabina so thank you uh so the next the next uh section is going to be updates from uh, from the Scholars Portal team about some of the work that we're doing that we're doing here, um, some of our our major projects over the last year, and looking forward, um, some of the work that we're going to undertake in the next year. So um, to kick things off, uh, Ginsley Mondesir and Alicia or uh, keep. Urquidy Diaz are going to give us um, a brief update on the Odyssey migration project and the front end redevelopment. So I will pass it over to them. And um, just, just sorry, just before I do, I just want to say that we're going to try and save sort of all the the, the Q and A for the end. But feel free to, of course, put questions in that Q and A module as. Um, as you want to. Okay, take it away. Thanks, Kate. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, bonjour. Uh, this is the ODZ migration and front end redevelopment updates. I am Gensley Mondizier, the virtual reference librarian at Scholars Portal. Uh, I will let my colleague uh, introduce herself. Good morning, everyone. I am Alicia Orquidi Diaz, uh, Metadata and Data Services Librarian at Scholars Portal. Great. Uh, established in 2008, developed and maintained by Scholars Portal. Uh, oops. Uh, we shall go over to the next slide. Okay, thanks. <laughs> established in 2008, developed and maintained by Scholars Portal, the Canadian ODZ repository provides access to more than 6,000 social science data sets, including microdata and census data from Statistics Canada, uh, Canadian public opinion data, and other, uh, and other sources. After over 10 years, the repository infrastructure was used for an upgrade. And in 2020, ODZ's backend software repository called Nestar announced it will Reach end of life. That year, Skulls Portal began to plan a migration to a new backend as well as a front end redevelopment for an up to date ODZ search interface. I will now hand it over back to Alicia. Thank you, Ginsley. Uh, here's a bit of an overview. Next slide, please. This is an, a bit of uh, an overview of the um, project's milestones up to now. So in 2021, a group, a working group came together to select a replacement for the Nest Star tool. In early 2022, the group issued a report to recommend that we migrate to Dataverse. Could you please go back one slide? Uh, one back. There we go. Thank you. Uh, to recommend Dataverse, a state of the art open source DDI compliant repository platform. Some of the main criteria for the selection of Dataverse where it's support for a bilingual metadata interface, uh, metadata and interface, as well as its support for the data, discover, uh, data documentation, excuse me, data documentation initiative, DDI, metadata standard. The standard was embraced years ago by the Occult data community and by Odyssey due to its granularity, flexibility, and interoperability with other schemas and technologies. The current project phase involves migrating all data collections into a test instance of Borealis, the Canadian Dataverse repository, which is also maintained at Scholars Portal. Next slide, please. Since 2022, the Odyssey Migration and Redevelopment Working Group has been working to carry out the recommendations put forth in this report to replace Nestar. This new group meets biweekly to discuss aspects of the migration and the redevelopment with members who include Scholars Portal staff, market project students and coordinators, as well as stakeholders at OCL and partner institutions. Next slide, please. During the current phase, 
the migration project team has worked to ensure all data and metadata from Odyssey is fully migrated to the new system, including Borealis, while tackling many compatibility gaps between the systems. This has included the enhancement of Dataverse support for DDI metadata, which is good, but not yet fully compliant with the standards. So we've been contributing to that development as well. Next slide, please. Working closely with the Odyssey Market Program, the Odyssey team, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, the Odyssey team has addressed metadata quality and implemented new controlled vocabularies. Alongside the addition of data site DOIs for Odyssey datasets, these improvements will significantly enhance the discoverability of Odyssey collections. And at this point, I really want to shout, do a shout out to all our students at the Market Project who've been such fantastic help in, in especially this stage of the project. Next slide, please. Further. With funding assistance provided by Compute Ontario, an upgraded search interface has been designed to provide new and enhanced searching and browsing features in full integration with the new Borealis backend. This will enable front-end improvements on the Odyssey search site, such as support for downloading files directly from the search results page and exploring survey questions and variables using the Borealis Data Explorer. And at this point, I would hand it back to Ginsley who has been working closely with the front-end development team and can give you an overview of their work. Thank you, Alicia. Regarding the front-end, um, next slide. Okay, thanks. Um, our main objective is to give our website a makeover and make it even more user-friendly. Uh, we are using the latest version of the Angular web framework to revamp the entire site. Also, accessibility has been at the forefront of our minds throughout the process. Uh, we have also implemented a tool for the uh, for depositor called the data curation tool and another one uh, for the researcher called the data explorer tool. Um, and we have created detailed documentation to guide our user. Uh, we are here to empower researchers in their data journey. Next slide. Thank you. Um, on uh, on one slide, uh, on one side, sorry, you'll find a, a visual representation of the current website. While on the other side, uh, we have an image showcasing the upcoming website design. Next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, um, here are the feature of the website, uh, some of the feature. Um, researcher can use the find data field to conduct an exploratory search. Uh, user can browse through also the diverse collection available in Odyssey. Uh, a researcher can easily sort a data set's results based on relevance or date. Um, user can narrow or broaden uh, their uh, data sets, uh, the data set results. Um, uh, the Browse tab, uh, uh, researcher can explore data sets, group on the broader ter the ter teams. And uh, for the entire website, we also had a new color palette. Um, next slide. Thank you. On the data sets result page, you'll find a comprehensive description of the datasets. Plus, you can easily preview and download all the files associated with the datasets. Next slide. Uh, each search result contains the following two options, matching variable and explore variable. Next slide. And, um, for the uh, researcher, uh, for the front-end user, uh, we implemented the Data Explorer tool. Uh, researcher can preview data, uh, create cross-tabulation, download a subset of a data set. Next slide. And finally, uh, for the data curation tool, um, once uh, uh, 
Next the slide, depositor. Oops, <laughs> thanks. Want, uh, the, once you select a, a, a survey, you can edit variable, uh, metadata, uh, apply weight. Um, uh, thanks. I will now hand it over back to my colleague. Thanks. Thanks, Kinsley. And next slide, please. Concurrently with the front end redevelopment, and again in close collaboration with the market program and the market group, the Odyssey migration team has been creating new and updated guides, documentation, and training material for Odyssey's users to support the transition to the new system. These materials include an updated best practices guide, an Odyssey user guide, new documentation for the connected Borealis Data Explorer and the data curation tool, as well as documentation for the Odyssey Search API, among other resources, handouts, training sessions and videos, and so on. Next slide, please. An Odyssey front end and beta release for public testing is expected at the end of this month, so stay tuned. This will be followed by an open webinar to showcase the beta release and new features. Next slide, please. And finally, the uh, odd, odd, the new there's a new uh, working group, uh, the Odyssey Futures Working Group at Ocul, which will meet regularly over 2023 to examine Odyssey's overall service and sustainability model to identify also potential new stakeholders who may contribute to the evolution and sustainability of the service and to recommend potential future business models for Odyssey. And finally, the next slide. The launch itself is anticipated for the fall of 2023 and the Nestar based Odyssey platform will be sunsetted in 2024. Next slide, please. Stay tuned uh, for the beta uh, release announcement. It will be coming in the next couple of weeks. In the meantime, you can preview the new Odyssey under the link on the screen, uh, tinyurl.com slash odyssey dash beta. Or if you want to write to us and have any questions, you can email us to odyssey help, odyssey dash help at scholarsportal.info. Thank you so much for your attention, and we wish you a very uh, exciting Scholars Portal day. Uh, well, thank you both, Alicia and Ginsley, for for the update, and really to all all the folks that have been working so hard on this migration. Um, the amount of progress that's been made is really pretty astounding in in the last six months. So. Um, uh, it's all good. So uh, next next up, uh, we have Julie Shi and Jenna May talking about all the wonderful work that they're doing um, with the permafrost service. All right, over to you. Thanks, Kate. Um, and yes, just echoing that the Odyssey site looks incredible. Um, had the privilege of looking at the beta site in advance, so I can say that it looks amazing um, and I hope you uh, get a chance to watch that preview and uh, do some testing with uh, when the beta release is out. Um, but on to Permafrost now. Uh, our updates don't include a new website but hopefully uh, they'll be just as exciting for you. Uh, my name is Julie Shi and I'm the Digital Preservation Librarian at Scholars Portal uh, and I'll let Jenna introduce herself. Hello everyone, I'm Jenna. I am the Permafrost Preservation Assistant uh, with Scholars Portal, and I also am the Digital Archives Technician at Algoma University. Uh, next slide, please. Great, so as a brief introduction to Permafrost, for those of you who may be less familiar, uh, the Permafrost Digital Preservation Service provides member organizations with hosted tools and infrastructure for digital preservation so that our members can focus on the nuts and bolts of preservation for their unique digitized and born digital collections. So these collections can include digitized photographs and audiovisual collections, born digital archival records that are received internally from institutional units or externally from private donors, aerial photographs and other geospatial data, and research data more broadly. Our team also provides technical support for using permafrost um, and preparing packages for preservation. 
uh, in less wordy fashion. And for those of you who like numbers, permafrost turned six this year with the first pilot run in 2017 and the service made available to all local institutions in 2018. And today our community is 13 members and 14 instances strong and our members are preserving 5.2 terabytes of digital content across um, over 1,100 packages with us. So that is very exciting to see. Uh, next slide, please. And from a technical standpoint, Permafrost hosts and maintains Archivematica instances for our members. So Archivematica provides an open source tool suite for preservation processes like extracting preservation metadata, converting file formats, and creating standards-based archival packages and access copies. And Permafrost relies on the Scholars Portal Cloud Storage Network, the Ontario Library Research Cloud, for storage. And Permafrost Storage was migrated to our new and improved OLRC2 in spring 2022. And so with uh, this new OLRC, archival packages are managed through the Dura Cloud application and access copies uh, are managed through the OpenStack dashboard horizon. And after hearing from numerous community members about plans um, to preserve much larger objects, so things like digitized video files and geospatial and aerial data, our team worked to introduce a new tool in Permafrost to respond to this need. So in fall 2022, Globus became the newest addition to our Permafrost toolkit. Uh, as a service for reliably transferring large volumes of data between locations, Globus allows our community to transfer and upload large volumes of data for processing in Archivematica. And with this suite of tools, there's a lot to learn and a lot to keep track of. So to round this out, our team provides technical support, which includes training, consultations, documentation, and more to assist our community with the permafrost toolset and planning and processing for preservation. Uh, next slide, please, and I'll hand it over to Jenna. Thanks, Julie. Um, so as Julie said, we do offer lots of technical support to our subscribers. And a big part of that support is creating lots of documentation around all of the different aspects of the permafrost service. Um, so one of our biggest pieces of documentation is a very extensive workflow with step-by-step -step instructions that um, really start at um, preparing your package for ingest in permafrost all the way through to the end and checking to make sure that everything did actually get processed properly and how to download um, the items that you've uh, processed through Permafrost. Another piece of documentation that our users have found really useful is a troubleshooting guide. And so this has info about how to identify and solve different problems that you might come across as you're going through that processing, prog uh, processing um, progress. Uh, more recently, uh, we have a very, very in-depth metadata guide about all different kinds of metadata. And so this gives really, really detailed uh, instructions on all the different things you need to do to create that metadata to make sure that it's ingested into Archivematica properly. Um, so that goes far beyond what's in the workflow because not everybody includes metadata in their package. Uh, as Julie mentioned, we recently uh, included Globus as a new tool. So we have documentation around how to use Globus uh, as part of your permafrost workflow. And we're constantly updating our documentation with more details uh, as we're doing more testing on things or new features. Um, we include um, new documentation for our users to look at. And we also have lots of internal documentation to make our own workflows uh, much faster um, and smoother so that we can help our users uh, to do whatever it is they need to do. Uh, so next slide, please. And I think I'm passing it back to Julie. Thanks, Jenna. Uh, so just a brief overview of the OLRC as well, uh, since permafrost would not be uh, the same without the OLRC. So uh, the OLRC is a private cloud storage network built on the open source OpenStack Swift software, and it provides secure, reliable, and scalable cloud storage to member libraries and archives for storing and sharing digital collections. So the nodes or data centers on the network are distributed across five academic libraries in Ontario uh, at the University of Toronto, York, Guelph, Queens, and Ottawa. And a huge thank you to these libraries for their ongoing collaboration and partnership for this. And from 2021 to 2022, the OLRC underwent a large scale refresh to migrate the network. Um, and this included um, new hardware as well as new software to increase storage capacity and performance, as well as introduce new features and functionality. Uh, which includes the Horizon dashboard for interacting with objects in storage. And during the migration, the team also successfully developed and implemented a Dura Cloud integration with the OLRC. And Dura Cloud is an open source application for bit level preservation that is developed by DuraSpace, which is part of Lyricis. 
And so DearCloud now sits on top of the OLRC and can be used to manage objects that are uploaded, uploaded to the OLRC using the DearCloud tools. And just a huge shout out here to the systems team um, and also our previous digital preservation librarian, Grant Hurley, uh, because I was not with Scholars Portal at the time of this migration. So all of this amazing work is um, because of their dedication and efforts. Um, but in relation to permafrost, Jira Cloud is used to manage archival packages generated by Archivematica, and it runs independent fixity checks and provides our community with the option to duplicate their archival packages to independent storage providers for geographic and technological diversity. And it's now been 10 years since the OLRC was first conceived and four years since it was launched in production. And today, 19 institutions are using the OLRC for their digital storage. Um, and in the past year, we welcomed the University of Victoria, University of Alberta, and National Gallery of Canada to the community. Uh, next slide, please. And alongside our toolset and storage capacity, the permafrost community is also continuing to grow. So the foundations for our growth were first laid in 2021 when the OLRC became available nationally uh, to support increasing needs for digital storage um, across Canada. Uh, but digital preservation is, of course, more than just storage. So in summer 2022, following interest from some of our new OLRC partners from outside of Oakle, Scholars Portal uh, explored the possibility of also extending permafrost outside of Oakle Google to support digital preservation across Canada. And in December 2022, permafrost became available to academic and cultural heritage organizations nationally. So as our first non ocal permafrost members, we're excited to welcome the University of Alberta and the National Gallery of Canada to the community and to support their work in preserving their collections. And a quick plug for Alberta, uh, they'll be sharing more about their plans for the OLRC and permafrost during our lightning talks tomorrow. So we hope you can join for that. And next slide, please, and back to Jenna. Related to the expansion of the permafrost community, we have been working on expansions to community engagement. Um, so we have uh, lots of different subscribers. We are getting more subscribers. And so we really wanted to give those subscribers an opportunity to talk to each other. Uh, so we introduced the user forum uh, as a platform uh, to facilitate that. Um, so previously, the forum was really just an opportunity for us as permafrost staff to talk to our subscribers and give them updates on things that were going on, um, new features that were added, our new documentation that was created. Um, but we really wanted people to be able to um, chat with each other on different things that they were doing. So we put together a, a number of different um, topics. Uh, a number of different boards with these different topics related to permafrost work. So that includes things like normalization, metadata, workflows, policies, and lots more. Uh, and there is an opportunity to add more message boards for different topics, depending on what people are interested in. Uh, so this is a place where users can chat with, seek advice from, and offer help to other users, in addition to the support that they get from us as permafrost staff. So this allows for a lot more collaboration and connection between institutes. Um, which is really great because a lot of subscribers are working on the same kind of issues. Um, so as Julie alluded to earlier, um, there is uh, kind of an increase in people processing large AVI files. And so there are difficulties that come with processing these specific types of files. So because a lot of people are doing that same work, it's great for them to have an opportunity to chat with each other and kind of work out, um, you know, what's the best way uh, to process these kinds of files together. Next slide, please. Um, so another um, opportunity to kind of expand community engagement has been our community calls that we've started doing. So we have done lots of webinars in the past, um, but we are expanding these video calls to include these more informal discussion meetings. So similar to the way the user forum used to just be kind of a one way discussion from us as permafrost staff to the users. Our webinars were really us giving information to the users, but these community calls offer more of a back and forth discussion and again allow users to talk with each other about the kinds of work that they're doing with permafrost. So far we've had two different community calls, one on file formats and one on workflows, and those have been really, really full, some really interesting discussions. And I think everybody's really enjoyed having that opportunity to talk more in depth about these specific topics. We have lots of ideas for future topics, uh, and those can include a community call on video formats specifically. In our file formats discussion, we did talk a lot about video formats, but we're hoping to have a call in the future to talk uh, even more in depth about that. 
Um, we can potentially have calls on rights metadata, which is an interesting aspect of metadata that a uh, few people are using, but not a lot. Uh, and manual normalization, which is a really interesting thing that I've been learning more about recently. There also is potential for lightning talks for specific use cases. Um, so if somebody has been doing something really interesting in their permafrost workflow, they can come and talk a little bit more about it. Uh, or do some deep dive workshops. So maybe we all look at somebody's policies and we all work together um, to develop those policies. Discussions can stem from the user form or be continued there. So they're really meant to work in tandem together and as a way to really engage people and make sure that as many people as possible are coming to these calls. Uh, we set up polls to determine the time and date. Um, so really making it uh, a very community oriented uh, aspect of our work at Permafrost. I believe that's the end of our permafrost slides. Um, so thanks very much for listening to Julie and I chat about this. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you both for those updates. And um, yeah, with the growth of with the growth of both the OLRC and the permafrost community, it it really that that sort of community engagement um, aspect through the community calls, I think, is going to be so important. So thank you for your work on that as well. So next up, um, we have Julia Gilmore to talk about Project Ramp, which is yet another service at Scholars Portal that's getting a little bit of a makeover. Take it away, Julie. Ah, sorry. Thanks, Kate. Um, and thanks. Uh, it's great to hear about Julie um, and Jenna, your work. Uh, with permafrost, I've been so impressed with the digital preservation services um, that Scholars Portal offers. Um, and as you'll see in this project, there's uh, some opportunities to work together on the digital preservation piece of this. So it's really exciting stuff. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is uh, Julia, and I'm the digital projects librarian at Scholars Portal. And I'm one of the project leads for RAMP, uh, which is, we can go to the next slide, actually the uh, records assessment and migration project, uh, or more informally, the spot docs migration. Um, so I'm sure we're all quite familiar with spot docs at this point. Um, it's an organizational wiki for OCL and Scholars Portal. Um, and I say being familiar with it because it's been around for a really long time. Uh, it was set up in 2006, so it's almost as old as Scholars Portal. Um, and it was set up on Confluence software. Uh, from the beginning, Scholars Portal has self-hosted uh, spot docs through a server license with Confluence. But in the fall of 2020, the company uh, that runs the software announced that they were changing their licensing, licensing model uh, and pricing structure. So ending support for server licenses, and that will be in February 2024. So the decision was made to move away from Confluence and to investigate finding a new solution for spot docs that will meet our community's needs. And so that's the kind of uh, broad overview of the project. Uh, to go to the next slide, um, just briefly in terms of the structure of spot docs, um, Spot Docs is the name for our Confluence site. Um, it's the container under which all of the spaces and pages that I'm sure um, many of you have visited over the years um, all of the different spaces and pages for services for groups and projects live. So when we talk about spot docs in the context of this project, we're talking about all of that content that lives and has accumulated within the site since 2006, all the spaces, all the pages and all the attachments. Next slide, please. Um, I thought this was kind of interesting just to, to give an idea of how spot docs has changed. Um, and some of you may remember this version. Um, this is a snapshot from the Wayback Machine of the homepage in 2007. And at this time, there were only 14 spaces. You can see them all listed right there on the main page. Um, and as you can see, the look and feel of spot docs has changed quite a lot, um, part, partly because we have a lot more spaces, there's a lot more work um, happening there. And also because the uh, Confluence software itself has evolved over time. So it does look a bit different. Next slide. So when we talk about uh, how many spaces we have now, there are quite a lot. There's um, just over 120. Um, and it's not just the number of spaces that have multiplied over time. Also, our user community has grown exponentially uh, from 145 uh, users in 2007 to over 1,000 today. Um, and what may be surprising is that number um, of 120 spaces. Uh, it's definitely a lot more than you see on the homepage. Um, and many of these are older or inactive spaces that were set up for past projects, committees, and working groups. 
So Spot Docs is not just a place where work is currently happening, it also then functions as a historical record of the organization and the work that has been accomplished over the last 15 plus years. Uh, with over 7,000 pages and 16,000 attachments that are dispersed across these many spaces, it's not a small project, but with that, uh, we really see that there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, next slide, please. So some of those opportunities. Um, well, first, we know that how and where collaboration is happening has changed, uh, not just within the organization, but just in general, um, since Spot Docs was first set up in 2006. So this project is a good opportunity to really identify what collaboration looks like for OCL and SP today. Um, in addition to selecting a new platform, this is also a really good time to kind of rethink and, and refresh the information architecture of Spot Docs. So it meets our community's present needs for creating, managing and finding information and supports finding that information into the future. Given how much content is on Spot Docs, we'll also be working with teams and groups to identify what content is act actively being used and referenced, um, and then also identifying legacy content, that historical record that should be retained and preserved. There's also a big opportunity here to shed some of that older and outdated content that doesn't need to go to the new platform, um, and that will also make it easier to find the information that you do need in Spot Docs. Uh, insights that we uh, gather throughout the project will also inform the governance communications plan that is being developed, um, and that will that will be helping to support a more intentional uh, flow of information across OCL and out to the broader community. And that plan is already underway, and the timing coincides really nicely with what we're doing with RAMP. So it's it's great to see this coming together. Uh, next slide. So just briefly, um, we're coming out of the discovery phase of the project, and this is some of the work that we've done so far. And all of the, um, all of uh, the information here is also available on Spot Docs under current projects. There'll be a link uh, in the slides as well. Um, so we've analyzed and reviewed all of the Spot Docs spaces and user activity, um, and this information will uh, help with making migration and archiving decisions down the line. We've also conducted environmental scans to look at Confluence alternatives with a particular focus on open source wiki platforms. We've looked at how other library consortia are approaching content management and collaboration within their own communities. And we've talked to organizations with similar migration projects about their experiences and also to hear about good practices that we might be able to apply in our work. We've also had a lot of really amazing, insightful conversations during the community consultation phase of this project uh, through interviews with Scholars Portal and OCL staff um, and focus groups with members of uh, OCL standing committees and communities and collaborative futures groups. We've also uh, distributed a user survey. This went out um, early last month. Um, it's open to everyone and it's also still running. It's available until May 10th. Uh, if you haven't completed the survey, we would really warmly encourage you to do so. It's really great to hear what what we really want to know what everyone would like to see with with this platform. So uh, the link has just gone into the chat um, and there's also uh, a link to the survey on the Spot Docs homepage. Um, and if you have filled it out, thank you so much. The responses have all just been so wonderful and have given us a lot um, to think about as we go into the next stage of the project. So to share some of the key themes that have emerged so far, we can go to the next, sorry, the next slide, thanks. So the consultations have underscored that there continues to be a need for a space to work, uh, for groups to work collaboratively um, and a space to put documentation. And also that real-time editing is a major priority um, in terms of collaborating effectively. Uh, we've heard how searching in Spot Docs is often a frustrating experience, um, and this is something that we are really looking to improve in the new platform while also recognizing that that piece around cleaning up older content and creating more structure within Spot Docs will also help a lot um, with finding information. There are a lot of other issues and also desired features that have been identified, and I won't discuss these today because there are quite a few, but just wanted to note that all of the great feedback we've received is really informing the selection criteria and the needs assessment for this new platform. So we really appreciate all of those ideas. Um, in terms of the role that Spot Docs plays for OCL and uh, Scholars Portal groups, uh, we found that it's most commonly used for meeting minutes, but it's also a place for documentation, for policies, 
uh, resources, contact and membership lists, and occasionally it's used um, as a space for working documents and for managing tasks. It is also not the only platform where groups are working and creating content, and, and we wanted to note that this has um, contributed to documentation drift and sort of information sprawl uh, across the organization and across multiple platforms. We've also noted interest in making more documentation and policies public, uh, and also a strong desire to have more guidelines and structure in place for organizing information, and also to keep spaces from becoming unwieldy and difficult to navigate. Uh, next slide. So as I mentioned, we're coming out of that discovery phase and looking ahead uh, to some of our next steps, which include completing a needs assessment that builds on the findings uh, from our, our discovery phase. Uh, we've done some very, very localized testing of potential alternatives, um, but we'll be uh, expanding our test group. Uh, currently, it's Bart and myself um, and doing some more formal usability testing, setting up a platform on it on our local server to, to help with the selection process. There will also be a change management plan coming out um, in uh, summer that will provide more detailed timelines uh, for what this project looks like over the coming months, and also communication about what will be required in terms of uh, identifying content for migration and resources to support this work. Um, and then finally, we'll continue to coordinate with uh, OCL staff on the development of that street strategic communications plan, um, which again coincides nicely with the timing and the desired outcomes for this project. Uh, so that is my update. Uh, just the last slide here, again, just a quick plug of that user survey. Um, we'll and also to note that we'll continue to share updates about the project over the coming months um, and that you can find that information on where else on spot ducks. So thank you very much for your time. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, some of the presentations coming up today. This is a fantastic event. So thank you for having me. Well, thank you, Julia. And you know, spot ducks is a little bit dear to my heart as it was one of the first uh, kind of projects that I worked on when I came to Scholars Portal. So I really appreciate the kind of the very thoughtful approach that is I think going to allow us to continue to collaborate effectively uh, into the future. All right, so our next speaker is uh, Ravit David, and she's going to tell us a little bit about um, the Emma ACE partnership um, that we have been working on over the past year. Thank you, Kate. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you, Kate, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and I have a really um, exciting uh, partnership to kind of review with you. We just ended the last development meeting in April, so that's been an ongoing uh, project and collaboration with, with the EMA folks. And so uh, I'm going to review it a little bit today, and um, and happy to take questions during the QA. So Emma, as you know, Educational Materials Made Accessible is a collaboration between the libraries and disability services offices, what we call the SOLs, um, at its member colleges and universities to facilitate the interchange of resources that has been remediated for accessibility. Based at the University of Virginia, it consists of federated repositories of content and the technical infrastructure that enables DSO to search across these repositories to obtain resources they need for the student, faculty, and staff they serve. Either resources to remediate or resources that have already been remediated in the ways needed by the particular individuals that require them. The original EMA traces back to a research project in 2015-16 that resulted in the article toward accessibility course content challenges and opportunities for libraries and information systems. It eventually grew into a Mellon grant known as FRAME. FRAME was co a collaboration among academic libraries, repositories, um, technologists and DSO. It involved the libraries and DSO at eight universities, uh, George Mason University, the University of Illinois, Northern Arizona University, Ohio State University, Texas A&M Universities, 
uh, Vanderbilt University, the University of Virginia, and two campuses at the University of Wisconsin. It also involved the integration of four significant repositories of content useful to students at colleges and universities, the Benetech Bookshare, the Internet Archive, the Hathi Trust, and ACE, the Accessible Content ePortal from the Ontario Council of University Libraries which is us. In addition, a fifth repository, EMA, was created at the University of Virginia for remediated uh, materials not originating in one of those repositories, along with the technical infrastructure that integrates them. And so, what is basically the legal um, foundation of this collaboration? Um, the legal foundation of EMA, as some of you already know, is that uh, it is not a violation of copyright to provide an accessible version of a resource to a person who has disability that impairs their ability to fully consume a published version. This is based on both the US law and the international law, the Marrakesh Treaty, to which the US became a signatory on February 8, 2019. Inviting a Canadian partner like ACE to join EMA was critical to test the Marrakesh Treaty and uh, in the next stage or the next grand stage you're hoping to add a European partner, at least one, uh, for, um, for basically um, testing the Marrakesh and also um, making sure um, uh, accessible texts are not um, limited by uh, national borders. Next slide, please. So as a repository, Emma stores all the remediated files for members uh, that have not been uh, sourced from uh, one or the other four repositories. Remediated files uh, from those repositories are returned to them, but are available to members via the Emma infrastructure. Emma also contains both the bibliographic metadata and more importantly to its mission, the remediation metadata, describing how deposited resources have been remediated. Searching with the Emma infrastructure searches across all the repositories, not just the Emma repository. Benetect uh, Bookshare is the most extensive collection of accessible books in the world, currently providing over a million books uh, in any five different accessible format, Word, Daisy, EPUB, Audio and Braille, and also on its own, has its own online platform. These books are provided free to uh, qualify students in the US colleges and universities and school and are available by low cost subscription to adults who join members. However, ACE, um, ACE partners and all the OCO members are now being able to use Bookshare as part of this partnership. Because of Benetech, uh, sorry, Benetech uh, high developed technical infrastructure and its expertise in the provision of accessible content, its technical staff has been a significant partner in the technical staff of, at the University of Virginia and in the development of the EMA infrastructure. So when uh, we got to join basically, um, to the EMA project, we got Benetech account and the, all the under the hood infrastructure of what you're looking in this slide, the federated search, is basically Benetech technology mostly to start with, right? The authentication and all that. In this slide, you can see EMA federated search and in the result, after putting an ISBN, you can see Shakespeare text, Midnight Night, um, Midsummer Night Dream, sorry, from the ACE portal. The nice thing about Emma Federated Search is that you can tell right away from which repository the text is coming from by looking at the repository icon on the right side of the screen. So you can see it's an ACE book. Rich metadata can also tell you the level of remediation done on this text and other details such as metadata values for accessibility features, the format features, and then you can basically decide if the type of remediation in the right, is the right one for your user. When I searched for Midnight Summer Dream, I found more than a dozen manifestations of the play with different format features and accessibility features. This allows our users basically to decide which is the best one and not being limited just for the ACE text if they have other remediation requirements that could be found in this repository. Next slide, please. 
Thank you. Uh, so EMA metadata for accessibility, uh, the core purpose of the EMA project and the infrastructure provided to implement it is to enable sharing of remediated resources by disability services and member institutions. The EMA infrastructure consists of a set of systems and tools engineering to facilitate this process, as well as a suite of repositories in which resources both available to be remediated and those having been remediated are stored. Along with the remediated resource, it is necessary to provide information in the form of metadata that identifies the resource and describes how it has been remediated. Um, the EMA metadata can be grouped into four categories, required bibliographic metadata, required remediated metadata, optional bibliographic metadata, and optional remediation metadata. And I think this is what's uh, so unique about this project that the remediation metadata is uh, very robust and allows you to actually know what work has been done on this text. So, for example, um, it, it, it is required for a remediator source that is depositing the repository to tell us whether the whole resource has been remediated, to choose true or false. Uh, the portion of the resource that has been remediated, is it just one chapter from the text or is it the entire check? the entire sort of sorry ebook that has been remediated um, the remediation status so remediated not remediated or born accessible for cases where the part the the text is uh, basically um, didn't need any remediation because it came from the publisher already with accessible accessibility features uh, remediation comments such as free text, so you can say, you know, OCR, proof, added images, description, and so on. So uh, a lot of open text option to basically describe work that it's not included in, in the other fields. And recently the ICE community has begun to explore opportunities to improve the metadata of in-house scanned materials that our members began to add to our repository since COVID. Uh, with over 5,000 institutional submissions and growing, uh, adding remediation metadata could help us know more about the remediation status of each text that has been scanned in our institutional, um, in our member institutions. Since the EMA metadata is geared towards accessible texts, and since they have taken their work to NISO in the hope to create a metadata standard for accessible text, it would be worthwhile for us in the future to consider adopting some of this work to update the in-house scanned text in our repository. And again, we can always upload those texts um, to the EMA repository and feed it back to the collective um, search uh, that we're using as well. Next slide. So finally, as of uh, as of January this year, all the ACE content is available on EMA, and most of our ACE coordinators have been using their accounts to download content for for their eligible patrons. In only about three months, Bookshare registered over forty downloads from OCL members, so that's quite impressive. And in this slide, you can see what our members are saying about this new and exciting partnership to make accessible content more approachable to our users. So I'll let you a minute um, to read the testimonies. And with this, I will end my presentation and pass it on to the next speaker. So thank you. Uh, yes, thanks very much, Ravit. Um, I uh see Katya's comment in the chat or was that I thought that was Karen's no Katya's comment in the chat about about uh Ace and Emma, Emma moving forward and we're we're really thrilled here to have this have this partnership move forward as well I think it's very important partnership um thank you so the next uh speaker actually has two updates um yay <laughs> So Sabina is gonna is gonna talk a little bit about a service assessment framework that we've been developing to do more sort of rigorous and um, hopefully informative assessment of our services, and then um, she's gonna give an exciting update on Racer. <laughs> well, I, I hope it's exciting anyway. <laughs> All right, um, take it away, Sabina. 
Thanks, Kate. And uh, yeah, thanks, Ravit. I think um, this work that's happening with ACE and Emma is uh, really important, really exciting to see, and informs some of what I'm going to talk about. So um, I just want to talk a little bit about the um, service assessment framework that we are developing at Scholars Portal. I think it's increasingly important and increasingly recognized as important to perform assessment, not just uh, to be able to demonstrate the value of our services and to sort of identify areas for improvement, but also for evidence-based decision-making going forward. And um, because of that, there was a need that was kind of identified um, at the SPOD and Scholars Portal level for creating a process that would make it really easy to, um, to perform these kind of one-time assessments of existing Scholars Portal services. Um, one of the tricky things with assessing a service in a consortium is that we have a lot of distance from other people who actually are using our services on a daily basis because we're kind of in our, our um, Scholars Portal bubble. So um, we designed this framework that will hopefully be flexible for how our different services work, the different kinds of questions we might have about our services that would be answered by an assessment, and the different ways that um, the OCL community interacts with, with services. You know, there's some services that we have at Scholars Portal that have like a working group, for example, that's very closely aligned with the work of that service and other ones that are a little bit more at, at arm's length. Um, so this framework will allow us to really quickly spin up a working group to do these kinds of assessments when we have a specific question that we need asked about a service. And um, the kind of key values for, for it are uh, transparency and um, community involvement um, to make sure that, uh, that we're communicating everything that's happening to members of the community and that members of the community have a say in our assessment process. So um, what does that look like? Very briefly, um, the question for when we need to do an assessment could be identified by Scholars Portal staff, by SPOT or the directors, um, by OCL SP, or by members of the OCL community that work with a service. So um, let's say a decision needs to be made. We want to make sure it's evidence-based. Uh, we, we decide we need to do some kind of assessment. Um, or maybe there's kind of changes in the environment. We want to do a new sort of environmental scan type assessment. Or maybe we just really want to be able to have a solid handle on the value of a service. These are all different reasons why we might identify a need for an assessment of um, a service. So the Scholars Portal um, team will work with SPOD to create a project charter that will include the objectives of the assessment based on those questions that we sort of identified um, for the reasons why we'd want, want to do an assessment, uh, a little bit of anticipated timelines and deliverables, and then some of the scopes, constraints, and other considerations that would go into the assessment. Um, after there's the project charter, then a working group will be formed, uh, which will include representatives from different levels. So it will include representatives from SPOD or their designates, which is sort of the director level, um, representation from OCL SP, which is kind of an AUL department head level committee, um, as well as representation from the OCL community group or committee that works the most closely with the service that's being assessed. And then the working group will create an assessment project plan and then do all of the assessment and um, present the final report and recommendations um, for community consultation with members of the community, as well as being posted to spot docs um, for transparency or, you know, whatever we have post spot docs. So that's the theory. Um, in practice, um, this is, like I said, it's a very new framework that we're just kind of developing. So our first sort of test case is ACE. Um, we are planning to launch an a assessment of the ACE service uh, soon. So a few of the reasons um, why we need to, or why we identified ACE as, as a case is that there's been a lot of changes in the ACE service over the past few years. Some of them Ravit was talking about the partnerships with Emma um, and being able to get content from Bookshare and other sources as well as the community submissions program that, that Ravid also referred to. So originally, ACE only included content that was scanned, digitized by Internet Archive. And then at the start of the pandemic, when uh, all of our libraries were locked down, we started sort of an emergency program to um, let people upload 
um, texts that they had scanned, digitized, made accessible in-house, um, and then we ingested those into ACE. But because that was kind of uh, added on a, an emergency basis during lockdown, we never really kind of thought through all of the implications and how it fits in. So um, one of the reasons why we're doing this assessment is to look at how we can adjust the service or um, look at the service going forward, given that there are these changes in sort of the environment of ACE. So a project charter was approved by SPOD in April and a call for working group membership will be going out very soon. So if you're interested and you're on the ACE working group or in the OCLA accessibility community or in OCLA SP, um, then uh, keep your eyes peeled. I think the call will be going out next week. Um, we're also hoping to get a member of, or, well, I guess members isn't the right word. We're hoping to get an ACE end user on this group. Um, I'm not sure if we'll be able to because it is kind of a tight turnaround time, but um, uh, we'll, we'll see. We're hoping, hoping to get someone in there. Um, if things go well, we'll have the um, report from this group in the fall. Um, we might end up changing the timelines a little bit, so don't hold us to this fall deadline. But after that, we go through this process and have the report, um, we'll be able to see how well the framework that we developed for this kind of assessment worked, and we'll be able to go back and um, make any changes, if any are necessary, um, in order to make sure it's kind of a solid process going forward. So that is the assess, um, uh, assessment framework. And now I'm going to move on to RACER. So um, RACER has been running since uh, June 2003. So it's almost 20 years old. It's one of our oldest uh, in, uh, services at Scholars Portal. Um, and it actually, the, the letters actually stand for rapid access to collections through electronic requesting, which most people I think have forgotten over the years. Um, but it was a kind of a revolution when we introduced it back in 2003 to be able to search across um, catalogs across Ontario and be able to request things and have you know fairly minimal staff mediation to, to what was in place before Eraser. So RACER has been running for almost 20 years and it's, uh, you know, thousands, millions of, of interlibrary loan requests have gone through RACER. However, um, the, so the software that's based on VDX is going to be sunsetting in 2024. Um, OCLC, uh, which is the vendor, uh, has known this is going to happen for a while and we've known this is going to happen for a while. Um, but at this point, we're starting to get close to 2024. It doesn't sound as far away as it did when they first told us that date. Um, so the OCLC sunset date is kind of, kind of a mid-2024, and our contract with them ends in March 2024. So that is when we anticipate sunsetting RACER at this point in uh, Mar by March 2024. Um, there was an announcement that went out yesterday that you may have seen, but just for, for a quick um, recap, um, the OCL Executive Committee will be forming a group to look at the feasibility of a long-term consortial resource sharing solution. Um, but if there is a new solution, um, it's not expected to be in place by the time RACER sunsets in March 2024. The timelines are very tight and um, a lot of the kind of next generation resource sharing software is just not really in a mature state in the market yet. So to assist with this transition, um, the plan from OCL is to continue to optimize resource sharing in Alma and in Omni, um, which will um, make sure that we are still able to do really robust resource sharing and um, kind of prepare us for the next steps going forward. So what does this mean kind of for interlibrary loan requesting um, to be able to do all of this in Alma instead of in Racer? So on the patron side, um, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, once uh, the institution has enabled resource sharing request and kind of done that configuration, patrons will be able to submit resource sharing requests directly from uh, Primo VE, um, Omni or uh, library search, depending on uh, what installation you're on, uh, using their regular account, just the same way that they put in hold requests, um, the same way they put in um, AFN requests for Omni institutions. And all the communication with the patron goes through Alma 
the same way as hold requests um, and you know digitization requests and all of that. So it's really straightforward and seamless on the patron side. On the staff side, there's a little bit more work that has to be done and a little bit more changes to um, workflows. So um, configuration has already been done for I think all of the current um, Alma subscribers to be able to actually do borrowing and lending um, of materials in Alma. The kind of big thing we need to do next is to add other institutions as partners in Alma. So that's sort of like adding them to your address book or your contact list. Um, once you have a library as a partner in Alma, you are able to send them a um, request uh, if you need to borrow from them, and you're able to receive a request from them uh, to lend to them directly from Alma. So um, that's kind of the next step in the process. Um, I will say that just because this work is primarily happening in Alma, that doesn't mean it can't happen elsewhere. If you do get a request from a patron that can't be filled by any of the partners you have added in Alma, you can still um, you move it to another system to fill it. And you can still use another system to, um, to lend. If you have, for example, WorldShare, you can still sign into WorldShare, see requests that are coming in and fill those there. So this is a um, kind of really quick timeline. Um, we have targeted July 1st as a date for um, blocking patron side access to Racer. So I think everyone um, on the Omni side at least has turned on um, the ability for patrons to make ILL requests in Omni, um, but um, Racer is still available. However, um, July 1st is our target date and September 1st is our deadline for when we think that you should um, block that access. I think it's easier to do over the summer rather than the academic year anyway. Um, in by October, we want to, or October 31st, we want to add as many partners as possible to Alma. And then um, on January 1st, we're going to do a soft cutoff uh, for um, ISO messaging, which I won't get into the distinction between different types of messaging, but there are different types of messaging. Uh, and uh, some of them will still be available after January 1st, but um, ISO messaging, we're gonna, uh, planning to do a soft cutoff on January 1st. And then the anticipated racer cutoff date is currently March 1st of 2024. So this sounds kind of intimidating, but actually a lot of this has already started. Um, especially for this, the Omni schools, um, resource sharing is already happening in Alma. Racer traffic has dropped uh, by about 60% since 2019. And that's really because by, by natural attrition that this traffic um, borrowing and lending is happening um, within Omni with the AFN or um, through Alma resource sharing in general. Uh, and about one third of Omni institutions have already done that step of blocking patron access to Racer that we had targeted for uh, July. Um, on the uh, Collaborative Future side, the Alma Resource Sharing Working Group is identifying priority partners to add, and they'll be added centrally to the um, uh, to the network zone and, and pushed out so that that prevents duplication of labor, and also working to identify policies and documentation that will need to be developed um, to support staff workflow. We're also uh, planning for non-Omni schools to, to meet one-on-one -on -one with um, resource sharing staff from those schools to um, discuss individual roadmaps for what the next year is going to look like uh, as we uh, transition away from uh, Racer. There's a space on spot docs with documentation, FAQs, and more information about this. We will also be hosting a monthly drop-in meetings uh, starting, I think the first one is scheduled for May 25th, to um, you know, share updates and hear your questions and, and feedback. And we also have a, a special email set up, uh, racer.transition at scholarsportal.info, which will go to um, everybody on the kind of racer transition team from the Scholars Portal and OCL offices. So um, I know that's a lot and I am anticipating answering a bunch of your questions in the Q&A later, but um, that's it for me. Thanks, Sabina. Uh, <laughs> Scholars portal without racer is like a very different <laughs> thing to imagine, but um, yeah, we'll uh, we'll we'll transition I smoothly away from that. Um, and we have our first question in the Q and A. So I'm I want to just to encourage people to to put those questions in um, uh, because we're at our last speaker, uh, Jacqueline White Appleby is going to give us some other updates. <laughs> can you um, hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. So why why don't why don't you uh start there? 
I sure will. And I'm cognizant that I am the only thing standing between you and a break. So I'll try to keep it short and peppy. Um, if I can have the next slide. So just a quick uh, update of sorts on the books and journals platforms to, to large older services that are continuing to run uh, pretty well. These are the sort of current stats uh, on books and journals. Um, so we have 66 million articles right now from 26,000 full text journals, about 3.6 million open access articles and 4.6 million downloads in 2022. On the book side, uh, we have about 650,000 full text commercial books. I'm missing a line here, but I do wanna say we have about at this point 825 open access books and that's commercial books, not content that's open, but explicitly um, academic books published by major commercial publishers that are fully open access on our platform. And we're really looking to grow that. Um, we're loading lots of special and unique collections. That's um, something we've been putting more attention towards. And I'm happy to say that our uh, most used collection, which is the Canadian University Press Collection, is now being updated weekly in Alma and also uh, on in WorldCat for schools who are using that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what we're working on now is loading, loading, loading. We have uh, a lot of that going on. All of our major publishers continue to produce a lot of great, great stuff that we're um, loading all the time. Um, but we're also trying to do more architectural and workflow improvements for this unique and one-off content. So on the journal side, an interesting project for us is loading journals that don't have an ISSN. It sounds fairly straightforward, but really the way that journals was built way back when the architecture uh, heavily relies on having an ISSN to, to um, bring content together and to display it. Uh, but we're now we're now getting content that doesn't have that ISSN. So thinking through how to do that. And on the book side, trying to think more about um, how to load and display multi-volume works in a way that allows users to sort of understand the, the, the scope of the work. And then finally, TDR workflow improvements. So more and more of our books content is going into the TDR. And this means we're starting to wrestle with uh, more kinds of questions about uh, what it means to add updates, to add corrections, to deal with corrupt files, um, to, to preserve XML book content, to preserve EPUB book content, uh, just a whole host of things. Um, so on the user side, what that means is more and more books have what this screenshot shows, which is the preservation metadata. And you can, you can see um, within a book record whether the book has already been uh, run through the TDR and um, which which files have been saved and just all of the preservation metadata and then eventually fix any checks as well on that book. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about a couple of projects that are coming up. So our GeoPortal is now 11 years old, which is pretty old for this kind of infrastructure, and, and it needs uh, a fairly significant update. The OCL directors have approved funding for a two-year reinvestment in the GeoPortal's back end. And um, that is that is something that we're we're ramping up with. Uh, we've been we've been talking about this sort of coming for a little while, but we've had a number of staffing transitions. And as you heard earlier, the data team has been really um, sort of full force on Odyssey. But but that that is is soon to be released, and we'll be putting more of our attention here. Um, so the project's ramping up now. We're we've hired some programmers, and we're in the process of hiring a GIS analyst. We need to do some more staff training, some planning, um, some work on getting Esri, the Esri portal set up, um, confirming all of the functional requirements that have been gathered and doing our concept design. If uh, geospatial data is in your wheelhouse, then look for a call for participation in the GeoPortal Advisory Committee, which is forthcoming. Uh, next slide, please. So actually, Ed did a great job of, of talking about the shared repository infrastructure pilot. So I'll, I'll not take too long with this. Um, but as he said, as many great things do, this started as a conversation in Oakle SP. And we found that schools were very curious about exploring the idea of shared repository infrastructure um, and really emphasis on the infrastructure part of it. There's a lot of work that's happening locally with, um, you know, working with, with faculty, working with authors. Um, doing, you know, workflow design, metadata improvements, but the question was like, what, what about the back end? It's a, it's a challenge to keep that up to date. It's a challenge to do the kinds of improvements and customizations that we would like. What would it mean for us to work together on that? Um, so these were the questions that the original working group were tasked with 
figuring out um, what is working and what is not within local schools and within uh, the, the sort of the folks that are doing this kind of work. Um, what models are being used right now? What tools are being used and what scope of work would make sense for sharing? So we conducted a survey last summer and a huge thanks to everyone who filled that out. We got responses from most schools and they were really robust responses with a lot of great data. Um, we also did a fairly significant literature review and we did interviews with other consortia who have chosen to share some part of their repository infrastructure. The final recommendation of the group was this pilot. Um, so DSpace is the most used repository software, both within OCL and across Canada. Um, and so that is what the group recommended that we go ahead with piloting. But while there's lots of DSpace expertise at many schools, it's not a software that Scholars Portal itself has a lot of experience with. So we really uh, are looking at this pilot as a way for us to understand what the workload would be of um, hosting a DSpace, of migrating schools to DSpace, and then of maintaining it and thinking through those sort of customizations and integrations and all the different workloads that might happen there. This pilot is also a time for us to um, sort of be working with CARL, the Canadian Association of Research Libraries. Um, many of you have probably heard that they are also interested in this kind of thing and are doing work in this space. So we want to make sure that we're um, in alignment with them and not sort of duplicating any kind of effort. So uh, the call for expressions of interest in being a part of the pilot phase, it has not in fact gone to directors, but it, it will go to directors shortly. And this is just a call to sort of say like, hey, do you think that you're going to be migrating soon? Are you interested in working together? Um, most schools do need to migrate if they're using DSpace to DSpace 7 in the fairly near future. So we suspect that there are schools who will be who will be interested in being a part of this pilot, but, but we need to have more conversations before we can um, decide where it makes sense to do pilots. And then uh, last slide, please. So the Scholars Portal Journals TDR uh, across the Arcan. This is more just for information at this point. It doesn't have a sort of direct effect on how anyone in Opal is, is using Scholars Portal Journals. Um, so this is a long discussed proposal to open Scholars World Journals for preservation access on a national level. Uh, Scholars World Journals, most of the content that is in there and that is being loaded in an ongoing way is uh, in fact content that's licensed at the CRCAN level. So there are many, many other schools across the country who are, are purchasing um, that, same, that same stuff all of the time. And so the question was, could Scholars World Journals be a preservation solution for a wider swath of Canadian schools. Uh, this proposal was approved by the CRCAN membership in fall 2022. And the work on that is uh, about to start. Um, so what it means for us is that uh, Scholars Portal Journals needs a much more robust sort of entitlements management and admin tool system because Scholars Portal Journals just was sort of built over time and our, our entitlements management was built over time, but also started out at a time when journals licensing was much, much simpler in terms of you bought a package or you didn't and you got everything. And if you stopped buying it, then you just stopped getting it. Um, you know, there are a lot of packages where you can come in and out and change the titles that are that are available to you over time. So so we that's already hard enough to do for Oakville. So in order to be able to do that for a, a more schools, we need we need a better back end for managing it. So this is a three year project. It's funded by CRKIN membership outside of OCL. Um, and the end result of it is in 2026 that Scholars of Portal Journals will be uh, available more broadly. Um, so the timeline right now, we're gonna do some requirements gathering, scoping sort of development of the architecture. What will this look like? What would we like it to include? Um, starting in 2024, we're going to work on the development of the tool, wireframing it, presenting it. Um, and then phase three, which I think we imagine happening in 2025 and beyond, is um, opening access to journals collections as CRCAM licenses renew. So most of those CRCAM licenses don't mention Scholars Portal, of course, because they're a national licensing uh, body. Um, so as those licenses come up every one or two or three years, uh, CRKN will be working with the steering committee on uh, in, inserting into, into those, that renewal process the right for 
for these other schools to access journals content um, in perpetuity through us. And that is all I have, I believe. Um, and so I think now it's time for a general QA and I will mute myself. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. And thank you to all uh, the Scholars Portal speakers and really to all the Scholars Portal staff for all the work that um, you guys are doing. So uh, now is our time for Q&A and there are a couple of questions um, that we have received. Um, please put uh, any additional questions into the into the Q&A module rather than rather than the chat. Um, but I am going to start with the first question um, from Peter Farrell. Uh, and it's about racer. I'm shocked. <laughs> so I'm going to ask Sabina to answer it live, but I'm just going to read it out first. And the question is, can Alma resource sharing do everything that racer can? Nothing can do everything that racer can. <laughs> After the cutoff, will there be any gaps left that Alma can't fill? Thank you. That's this is a really good question. Um, I think the um, the answer is um, a little bit more complicated than a straightforward yes or no. So Alma resource sharing has all of the core uh, resource sharing functionality uh, to be able to um, borrow, to lend, uh, to be able to have um, kind of uh, user requesting and that kind of stuff. Um, there's a couple of gaps that exist right now that we know Ex Libris is working on. So for example, with Racer, we have ways for um, external libraries that don't have a interlibrary loan system, like maybe a small government library to request from us. Um, and uh, all my resource sharing doesn't have this right now, but they're, it's something that they're working on. Uh, there's also a few things that um, are from like the kind of management level that we're able to do with Racer because we hosted it itself that we can't do with all my resource sharing because it's hosted by someone else. Somebody at Ex Libris could, you know, make some of those changes, but it just sometimes takes time to to get them to to do those things. Um, for example, to add a new um, uh, to create a, a new Rota that has um, partners that you can search their catalogs. Um, that's something that we can do really easily ourselves at Racer, but to do it in Alma Research Sharing, you need to request somewhere at Alma to do it for you. There are also things that there's a lot more different configuration options in Alma, and we haven't explored them all yet because we haven't fully started using those features yet. So I think it will actually be really instructive to use Alma Research Sharing for a while and then see if there's anything that we miss that we used to be able to do in Racer that we can't do anymore. Um, that will kind of help inform this work that this um, new OCL uh, group is doing. Because right now we don't really know, like every now and again, we'll find something that we, you know, have to turn on a setting for that we didn't know we had to turn on a setting for. And maybe maybe when we turn that setting on, it won't work the way we thought it did based on how rates are worked. So I think we really need to work in the system to understand what the gaps are. But the short answer is all of the core functionality is there. All of the most important functions of interlibrary loan are definitely covered. So I, I don't have any concerns about us switching to Alma for the, the short term. I hope that answered your question. It was a little bit rambly. <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, so um, for you again, Sabina, uh, Amy Rutherford asks, what percentage of ILLs are filled by rapid ILL? I don't know if you know the answer to that off the top of your head. I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. So uh, for those who aren't familiar. Oh, but maybe Alex knows. Maybe Alex knows. I just see his hand. <laughs> rapid ILL is um, a... Uh, uh, an Ex Libris product that only does um, like digital copies. So it doesn't do physical items. It only does like copies of articles or chapters. Um, the thing about rapid ILL is that each school has their own instance. So we don't, I don't think we have any central data for that. So people would need to report it to us unless Alex has central, a centralized data that we don't, uh, don't know. But I do know that for schools that have implemented rapid, it's only a pretty small percentage of their, um, copy requests or like uh, article and chapter requests that don't get filled by rapid that they have to move over to another system. So I don't know if Alex wants to comment. 
Um, the the official numbers that that Ex Libris has told us is that a, a slightly over ninety five percent of electronic requests do get fulfilled via Rapid ILL. Um, Sabina mentioned it's just the electronic ones, and uh, ninety five percent is a pretty incredible number. Let's be honest. It is. <laughs> Um, okay, well, thank you for that. So um, our next question comes from Bill Denton, and he asks, well, first, first a comment, it was great to hear that open source platforms are being looked at for replacing Confluence, SP use of open uh, software is admirable. Um, and it's nice to see how much of it's being discussed today. Well, thank you very much. Um, outside of Alma Omni, what are the biggest proprietary so uh, software systems used by SP these days, if any? Uh, and I'll take a crack at that, although I'll probably forget some. Um, but probably the, the two biggest uh, softwares that we're using are uh, Esri um, and for, for geospatial data, and then also MarkLogic, which we, which, uh, we uh, use as an XML database for a lot of for a lot of the the, the platforms that we build. Um, I'm just I'm trying to think. You know, we're, we'll say goodbye to to Confluence, to VDX, um, and to Nestar. Uh, so so those those will be three that will be going away. And I I I can't think of any other off the top of my head that we're I using. Think the biggest um, user facing one is the oh. um, library help yes. software yes. for and library, uh, help. library and chat. Yeah. yeah, of course. So, all right. Um, there was another, there's another uh, question in, in the chat um, from Anthony. And I think Jacqueline sort of answered this right as you were typing it. Um, but the question is, there was a recent survey for shared IR infrastructure at the national level that came from Carl. Um, are the initiatives related or in communication? And um, uh, I would say they are both related and in communication. Um, the timing was such that these two initiatives got off at the same time and have sort of been operating in parallel. But there is um, very, very close communication uh but between between the two and um uh yes but they they haven't they haven't merged as of yet but they're but the, they're we're, they're working very closely together um all right so hope that answers that question uh the next question is about emma um, from Mark Wheeler, will Emma include sharing of remediated journal articles at this stage? And I don't know, uh, Ravit, if you want to answer that question. Um, yeah, so I think uh, at this point, um, it's not so much uh, focused on journals. We included everything that was in the ACE repository, and the ACE is mostly monographs in its in its nature, obviously. Um, but I think uh, it's not set in stone. So, meaning, if there are specific texts that you would like to upload to Emma that are non monographic in nature, you are able to do it using using their um, process uh, and the accounts that we received from from Benetech. So if you have a specific content that you would like to see there and you have you're willing to invest in putting all the metadata that they are requiring when you do a batch upload um, to their repository, then you can definitely uh, add journals to there. We we just added what what was in ACE at this point. And I think Emma is basically the grant it was, as I said, mended, ended at the end of April, but they are applying for a new grant at the end, at the beginning of December 23. And hopefully um, the work will continue again to find a to find more partners and, you know, form a different like more new models of membership 
but their focus will be on metadata and metadata for mediation. So, you know, that would be a good time to look at journals and specific uh, metadata for accessible text to, to see how, how it can be incorporated. Um, so we can talk more about it, Mark, if you want, uh, offline. I'm happy to, to explore this, this avenue with you. Okay, great. So we've we've eaten up a little bit of break time and I don't see any more uh, questions either in the Q&A or in the chat, only, only um, memories of old software. Uh, so I think probably just want to say again, a big, a big thank you to everybody who's participated. And I think we'll see you guys after break for some exciting lightning talks. Thanks everyone. Yeah, so we'll go to break now and we'll come back 11.45 or uh, maybe a minute or two after 11.45. All right, hi everybody. We're coming back from our break now and I'm going to pass it over to Annika Irvin Ward who is going to be the moderator of today's lightning talk session. Thank you very much, Sabina. Um, hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um, welcome back everybody. Welcome to the first of our lightning talk sessions for Scholars Portal Day days on this first day of Scholars Portal Day. Uh, my name is Annika Irvin Ward and I am the uh, Assistant Director for Collaborative Initiatives here at UCOR. Uh, we have um, four presentations today in um, our first group of lightning talks and um, we will be moving, moving through them and having questions at the end of each lightning talk. Um, as before, if you can add any questions you have to the Q&A module down the bottom of your, your screen there, uh, and we can ask them when, when everyone finishes. Um, so the theme for this uh, first set of lightning talks is refresh, reframe, renew communications and services. So a great continuation of the theme from, from the Skulls portal presentations this morning as well. And I always really enjoy hearing these lightning talks and getting getting to hear about what is happening locally at all of our member institutions. So uh, to begin with, we will start off with a presentation from Queen's University, um, from Maggie Gordon and Caroline Smith. And it's from Inside Out, Reframing Virtual Reference Promotion at Queen's University Libraries. Over to you. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Maggie and I'm the Virtual Reference Coordinator and an Engineering and Science Librarian here at Queen's University. And good morning, I'm Carling and I'm the Ask Us Reference Assistant. The topic of our presentation is from the inside out, reframing virtual reference promotion at Queen's University Library. And we have divided our approach into three main goals. So first some background. Queen's is a mid-sized research intensive university with over 30,000 full-time and part-time students. We have seven libraries, including archives that serve the university's various faculties. Queen's first joined Scholars Portal Ask a Librarian chat in April, 2019. For those who may not be familiar, this is a collaborative live chat service with 16 participating academic libraries across Ontario. Last year, our library underwent a reorganization that resulted in a refresh of functional teams who do work related to virtual reference, or VR as we're going to call it. Previously, we had two separate teams, the reference assistance, or RA team, and the chat operators team, which included RAs plus librarian chat operators. Often there was overlap in the information being shared to and from these teams, so it was decided to combine the two teams into one virtual reference team. 
This convergence means that we have one communication channel for shared virtual reference work, which covers three of our Ask Us services. So there's chat, email, and LiveAnswers ticketing. So starting from the inside, our first goal after the reorg was to promote virtual reference services within the VR team. And this may sound like a very obvious statement, but what we're really trying to establish is a position of VR team members as ambassadors of our service. So the VR team is often the first point of contact with many patrons, and they're ideally placed to promote library services and establish connections between patrons and specialist staff. The training materials may not be traditionally seen as a promotion activity, but we're approaching this from the perspective that a robust training program will help our team speak confidently and promote the library's VR services to all audiences. So we streamlined our training materials, which happened rather organically as we combined two MS team spaces into one and did an audit of all of our files. So this resulted in two training wikis in our new VR team space, one for RAs and one for chat operators. And this replaced many individual training documents and guides. The new format and its location makes the resource much easier to refer back to as needed and has really eased our onboarding process. So moving beyond our core VR team, goal two focuses on internal promotion to fellow staff members at the library. This goal is focused on advocating for our VR team and for virtual reference services. Otherwise, this work is easily rendered invisible and the value these services provide to our community becomes lost. We also want to demystify what it is our VR team does, how these services work, and who we help. Promotion to our colleagues also shows why VR services should be promoted externally. It illustrates larger user patterns and trends, and we can discover collaborative opportunities with staff outside of the VR team. So to accomplish this goal, we created a virtual reference statistics dashboard using Genially. So here's an example dashboard for the month of February 2023. And the link we're sharing in the chat now has a reuse button at the bottom. So feel free to save this for later if you would like to use this design as a template. There are five graphs that illustrate data according to the service. We report on the total number of Queens chats, and this includes the previous two months data as well. Um, a comparison of chats into regular versus proactive, the total number of emails versus tickets, and a breakdown of chat, email, and ticket question types according to the categories facilitative, basic, complex, or referrals. And just a brief note about the data sources, each graph states where the information is coming from. So it's either RefStats, which is our in-house program for recording all reference interactions, or Library Help, the platform that Ask a Librarian Chat is provided through. We also have a dashboard to summarize the previous academic term. So this is an example from fall 2022. The graphs are all the same as our monthly dashboards, but this provides four months of data as opposed to one. So it just helps highlight longer term patterns. We do have a lot more to say about Genially, which is a free tool similar to Canva, but in the interest of time, we're gonna skip over that for now. Um, but we've had great experiences using it so far and I welcome any questions about it after our presentation. So while quantitative data is helpful and we wanted to share stats information with our colleagues, it's admittedly limited in what it can show. So we came up with a solution. After our monthly virtual reference team meetings, we post an update to our internal library-wide SharePoint news space, and we've included an example post here. The posts include two things. First, our dashboard, which shows uh, the hard numbers. And then second, some sort of contextual highlight about our service or team. So it's never just a link to the numbers. There's always more to it. These posts spark further conversations about reference services more broadly as people outside of the VR team have an opportunity to comment and share their perspective. And moving forward, our third goal is related to external promotion to the public. So we're recommitting to promoting virtual reference services to increase awareness among students and researchers. We're calling this a recommitment because while we have done some external promotion in the past, we haven't been super consistent with it. So part of these promotional ideas include adding a chat box into LibGuides. This box is still in its design stage and has not yet been presented to all staff, but the intention is that it will be completely optional to use and the accompanying text customizable. So it's not meant to replace subject specialist expertise, but just to provide another avenue for students to get help when their librarian is unavailable. A strong referral practice will always be foundational to our chat service. We have two options for this in LibGuides. The first is to create a new LibGuides box as seen in the first image that can be placed anywhere on a page. 
And the second is to add a chat button to the guide owner's profile page, which can be seen on the image on the right side. And I'm happy to answer any questions about the creation process during question period or by email. We're also creating some reusable slides that library instructors can add to their own decks that highlight our chat and ask us services. Instructors can choose to use the slide as is or just borrow certain elements such as the images or text. Again, these are just optional add-ons and our goal is to make it easier for staff to promote our chat service when appropriate. And then part of our external promotion plans also involve a coordinated and consistent communications plan. We'll be working with the QUL communications coordinator to develop this, but some activities will include things like revamped signage in libraries, social media posts, and departmental newsletter announcements, just to name a few. And we know many Ask a Librarian institutions already do this, but this will be a renewed effort on our part. So that brings us to the end of our lightning talk. We'd like to take a moment to acknowledge past QUL chat, chat coordinators, Michelle Chittenden and Natalie Soini, who helped get us to this point for which we are very grateful. And we also wanna thank Ginsley Mondeser from Scholars Portal who oversees the Ask a Librarian service. We are so appreciative of all the support over the years. And thank you for tuning into our presentation. We hope you enjoyed our update. Thank you very much, Carling and Maggie. That was, that was, um... A, a great presentation. We do have a couple of minutes for questions now, so you can, as I said, add them to the, the question and answer um, box and um, happy to read them out. Um, I, I was taken by how, how comprehensive and, and integrated this, this whole approach is, and I think that that's really um, admir admirable. Okay, we have a question from Peter. Um, I might have missed this, but can you elaborate on the difference between a regular versus a proactive chat? Yeah, I'm happy to, to answer that. And apologies, we weren't able to go into too much detail and explain everything. Um, so some of that kind of background info we had to skip over. But um, a regular chat uh, just means that it's going to be our static button. So it's just always um, present versus a proactive chat, which would be um, it's sort of like a small pop-up window that comes up. I believe we have our set to 45 seconds. Um, so it just kind of proactively asks patrons if they need any help. Great, thank you. Um, we also have a, um, a question from Kate Gibbings. Do you do any physical or digital signage advertising within the library locations? So right now we don't, um, but that's one of the things that we're really hoping to start doing. So we do have screens, um, digital screens in each of our libraries that we can promote chat on. And we're also hoping to put little signs on the study desks kind of interspersed throughout the library so that students can see that we have chat at the point of need. All right, I have one question. I know we do have, um... Uh, a couple more minutes. You mentioned you had a lot to say about um, generally. Is that how, how you say it? I wonder if you have some some key takeaways from from using that that you would like to share with people who are maybe considering investigating it. Sure. Um, so basically, genially is sort of like a more interactive version of Canva. Is sort of how I've been describing it. Um, so you can create interactive presentations, infographics, training modules, visuals, all kinds of stuff, um, and the, what we used for our stats dashboard, um, we customized a one page infographic template, um, but it's possible to have multiple pages if you would like that. So you could click into one aspect and um, be taken to more information or however you want to design that. Um, I also mentioned that Genially is a, it's a free, free platform. Um, you just have to sign up with an email address. So very similar to Canva in that way. Um, and it has a number of accessibility features as well, which is uh, one of the reasons that I like using the platform. So for example, um, screen readers are compatible with designs and interactive buttons. Um, you can add alt text and image captions as well as link descriptions. Um, there's text categories like title and subtitle. So that would be conveyed through a screen reader and you can navigate through designs without needing a mouse and just using a keyboard, um, just to name a few things. Um, yeah, there's other aspects as well, but I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. I, I may have just found some homework for myself. So, <laughs> um, thank you both for your for your presentation.
Okay, so now we will um, move on to the next presentation from Western University. Um, we, this morning we have Katya Perry Slutska and Emily Kalar Johnson presenting Rebuilding Our Connections Western Libraries Outreach Strategy and a New Approach to Relationship Building. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, Emily and I would like to welcome everyone to this lightning talk. I totally dropped the ball, Emily. I thought that the slides were going to be integrated with the uh, Scholars Portal Day presentation. So just give me a second. I'll get them up. I can share them if you like, Katya. If that's... That would be great. Thanks, Annika. Yeah. Okay. Just give me a minute. Apologies, as soon as I do that, then I lose my, my stream. So just give me a minute. Do you want me to share them, Annika? I have them in front of me. That would be great. Thank you. Okay, one second. All right, thank you so much, um, Sabina and Annika. So Emily and I would like to welcome everyone to the session. Um, we will talk about rebuilding our campus community connections at Western Libraries. So um, our slides are not very image heavy. In fact, we don't really include anything except for just a kind of general overview of this work. Um, so on the next slide, you will see that this work has been exceptionally difficult, um, and we'll start the conversation by acknowledging myriad uh, challenges related to outreach, especially in the context of the last few years. So in 2020 to 2022, as we all know, there's been significant shifts in the landscape of university campuses, and a Western has been no exception. We experienced a uh, significant staff renewal um, as institutions laid off staff, people moved around to be closer to their families or even refocusing their responsibilities. So the landscape had been completely kind of renewed. Um, this is also particularly significant given that partnership work requires intentional and frequent maintenance of these types of relationships, um, especially when they're not project driven. There isn't a defined beginning or end. It's just a new partnership that you forge and how do you maintain that in an active way um, to continue conversations with, with that particular stakeholder. Um, in 2022, Western Libraries also rolled out our new strategic plan, Forward Together. Um, and in, in the spring of that year, uh, this strategic plan included an increased emphasis on relationship building uh, with specifically very diverse communities on campus. So these new directions have allowed us to revive lost, lost and atrophied relationships on campus with our key partners. Uh, where they were strategically meaningful, but that also meant that we had to uh, find alignment and priorities with new partners and identify who they were at institutional or municipal or national, international levels. So reaching out and introducing ourselves to our campus um, and building these new partnerships have highlighted our need for increased visibility on campus and the difficulty of inserting ourselves into these key conversations after not being a part of them for so many years. 
Um, so we wanted to normalize the fact that libraries are at the heart of our community and our core services, which are foundational to operations of our organization. We're truly foundational to all aspects of teaching and learning and research and scholarship on campus and so much more. Plus, we provide incredible spaces for students and faculty and visitors and researchers to come and be and have access to our collection. So we do a lot of things. So on the next page, you'll see a bit of information about this new document that um, we developed. It's a Western Libraries Outreach Strategy um, took shape over the past year and a bit. And as the outreach and engagement librarian at Western Libraries, I work together with a lot of um, uh, partners and collaborators, um, namely Heather Campbell, who's our curriculum librarian, who has been also responsible for putting together this uh, groundbreaking justice curriculum for uh, the teaching and learning team, but also all of Western libraries, which had redefined how we interact with people, um, place the emphasis more on like an individual driven relationship rather than transactional types of relationships um, and, and just kind of revolutionize that work. So applying that lens to the outreach strategy and trying to think how we develop these relationships and maintain them to, um, to redefine and renew our approach to partnership building. And so you might ask, why do we care about intentionality? And I think that in order to find alignment between effort and institutional directions, but also to help us position this work in a way which addresses our bigger organizational goals and helps us determine things like who are our partners? Do we need a partnership inventory at Western Libraries? Who are we missing? Where are the gaps? And how do we know that our partners are effective? Our partnerships are effective. You know, people that we have worked with over so many years, are, are these still partnerships that are relevant to our new directions? So thinking about templates and uh, assessment mechanisms as well and documenting what this work looks like. Um, and are we everywhere that we need to be, for instance? Are, are we, is, our, is our voice missing somewhere on campus and beyond where we can insert ourselves and be a part of conversation that shapes what the vision of Western University campus is? Um, so these are the bigger questions that we wanted to define and answer and conduct this research to develop a framework to help organize this work. So the strategy is intended to support Western Library's strategic goals by introducing and sustaining this type of intentional approach to system-wide outreach and engagement work, and to provide essentially an environmental scan of the campus landscape and these key partners for outreach, um, as well as help to identify outreach and engagement goals and objectives specific to Western Libraries. One of the recommendations resulting from this document focused on the development of a community of practice around partnership building to connect staff across Western libraries um, who engage in this work and find mechanisms to support various units which have been challenged by the complexity of this work. Um, I will now hand uh, the microphone over to Emily who can expand on what this practically has meant for us. Thanks, Katya. Next slide, please. So with Katya's leadership, our open access committee has used the broader outreach strategy framework that she just mentioned to begin developing an outreach and community strategy focused specifically on open access. So we're building a strategy to help us achieve our goals of making our work and supports for open access more visible, such as the open access journals that we host on open journal systems through Scholars Portal. And we're hoping that this might eventually increase access to funding and resources for this work. It's also important to us to improve campus understandings of topics, issues, and supports related to open access to enable allies to then better communicate these messages with their partners. Next slide. A focused strategy feels especially necessary right now, given the current state of open access. So just a few years ago, we were focused on sharing messages about the values and importance of open access, but now we're also up against things like increasing open access fees, gold open access models that require payment in order to publish, and read and publish agreements that offer discounts or waivers on some of these fees, but that apply only to a few publishers and in some cases may even just be temporary. 
So all of these are changing our community's understanding of open access and are making less visible some of the other initiatives that we support and champion, like routes to open access that don't require payment. Unpacking these alternatives is complex and requires a different message for each group. How can we effectively communicate this nuanced work to our target audiences, each with their own understanding of and motivations for open access? Next slide. Our outreach strategy, where we're outlining things like who are our partners, what do they know, what do they need to know, and how to re reach them, will ideally help us get there. Now, this work um, and this strategy that we're creating is very much a work in progress, and but we are happy to speak to um, some of the things included in it during the Q&A. Um, but I'll note that as far as next steps go, our, our first step is to, of course, finish the strategy. And then as we roll it out, we'll need to focus on incremental steps and targeted messaging. We know that we're not going to be able to do everything all at once, and we certainly don't want to overwhelm our partners. We also see a need to coordinate our messaging with what our colleagues are communicating at other institutions. Open access doesn't exist in a vacuum, and we want to make sure that our messages and what we're saying um, and what we're saying is important aligns with what other schools are communicating. So having given you a, a brief example of where we've applied the broader outreach framework that Katya has mentioned to specific work that's happening within Western libraries, I'll turn it back over to Katya to close this out. Thanks, Emily. Um, and next slide, please. These are just our concluding remarks. Um, I wanted to point out that creating a structural supports for outreach and engagement across Western libraries has met, meant internal organization of this work across our department, across our system, to develop new teams like the Outreach Community of Practice, uh, which Emily had alluded to, um, a new user services outreach team led by our user services manager, Alison Weatherall, and the forthcoming Student Advisory Council, which will provide Western Libraries with a formal opportunity to have regular conversations with our students about our spaces, services, and more. So we, we haven't had channels like this in the past, and we certainly haven't had structures in place to formalize this kind of conversation and feedback and ongoing dialogue with our students or um, across our staff. So we're trying to create and build these mechanisms to make this work more sustainable and more straightforward. I also wanted to add that Ontario universities are challenged with the shift in our priorities, and our libraries are challenged with capacity to take on larger projects, but our visibility on campus reminds, remains of strategic importance. So focusing our efforts on outreach and how we engage with partners and where we're visible and how we position ourselves on campus becomes that much more important. Raising the profile of what we do and where our expertise lies will get us more recognition and more partners in the future. And that could mean things like funding, increasing our partnerships, helps us make a better argument for what we already work across, you know, the province or nationally. These are consortia partners or other school partners. Um, you know, we're a credible and reliable partner to manage funding, for instance. Um, and I also wanted to highlight the value of testimonies. And thank you, Ravit, for including some of those earlier when you were talking about Ace and Emma. Um, I also think that uh, finding ways of this type of partnership building work where we have a way to understand and evaluate what these partnerships do for us or our impact of Western libraries, for instance, on our partners is really important so that we know that we're headed in the right direction with this work. I wanted to conclude by reading one of the testimonies that um, I received at the end of the semester from the Vice President of Student Support and Programming at University Student Council, commenting about the impact of Western libraries on undergraduate students. Working with Western libraries was an absolute pleasure this year. We were able to host and attend engaging programming that had students' well-being front of mind. The space is welcoming, and I'm excited to see what they do in the future. It is clear to see how much Western Libraries cares for students. With that, I will conclude, and we welcome questions from anyone about anything. Um, this is all fairly high level, but we can definitely dive into more detail. 
Thank you very much, Katya and, and Emily. It's really, it's really interesting to see the way that you've, um, you know, taken taken the time to really understand that the strategic approach needed to to outreach and how it's um, how it impacts all of these these different areas. And that the OA example, I think, is a really interesting one, particularly given how complex um, a conversation it is. Um, so maybe we'll just see if we have any questions on this. I guess I just did have one quick uh, question, particularly um, about the uh, finding your champions at uh, to connect with um, in relation to OA, I guess, on campus. How, how has that experience been? Um, I know that that's an experience that even pretty my time here at Western. So I've been here since 2020. And I know before that, um, there were a group of people working on building um, an open access policy and finding the champions was certainly part of that. Um, I think the, pro the, so the process has been a long process, um, but I think there are several of us doing this kind of open access work, um, various facets of it. So we have a collections team here that does some of the transformative agreements and memberships pieces. We have the folks like myself and a colleague who host our open access journals, um, another colleague who hosts the open access repository, and then people even above us who sit, you know, at the dean's level. And so I think um, it's just been a process of finding the people that we've been working with who are very engaged in this work and um, building those relationships over time and having conversations with them and then either reaching out with specific asks at points like, hey, send this message to your colleagues or, hey, come sit on this committee to form an open access policy. Um, that's what we found has worked for us over the last uh, several years. But um, as we've talked about here, it's still an ongoing process, especially with some of the messaging that we want to send changing. Yeah, it's, it's complex. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, I will note that if anyone has any uh, questions, we will have, um, you can put them in the chat, oh, sorry, not in the chat, in the Q&A um, module and Emily and, and Katya will be there to be able to answer them as we go through as well. Okay, so our next presentation is um, from Lacey Kane at Carlton University. Um, and Lacey is, is here with us. Um, she has kindly recorded her presentation uh, for us, so I'll be sharing that with you for a moment, but she she is online here to, um, to answer any questions and do the Q&A at the end. Um, so the presentation is Data Services Web Page Refresh. Just let me... Hello and welcome to my lightning talk. My name is Lacey Kane and I'm the data support specialist here at the McGodrum Library at Carleton University. I want to talk to you today about my ongoing project, which is the Data Services Web Page Refresh Project, and I will be providing some helpful tips and tricks that I've learned from this project. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge and respect the Algonquin Anishinaabe people within whose unceded and unsurrendered territory the McGodrum Library is located. So let's talk about the project. Due to a historical lack of capacity, the data services team did not have time uh, or the ability to conduct a thorough cleaning of its existing web pages, which resulted in a lot of outdated content and a spider web of interconnected pages. We really wanted to streamline our pages and content for ease of access for our users, but also for easier maintenance for us going forward. What we had was a lot of older files attached to some of our web pages, such as data dictionaries or code books, and now those files are housed elsewhere, such as Odyssey or Borealis Dataverse, and no longer needed on the web pages themselves. So that was something we really wanted to tackle during this cleanup. And we also wanted to ensure that we were complying with accessibility standards and best practices as set out by the library, but also by the university. It's very important that all of our users can access the content they need, even if they're using assistive technology. So in preparation for the project, I completed Carleton's website review training, 
It is openly available and I highly recommend it and it will be linked on my slides. So please uh, feel free to take that if you would like. I also conducted an environmental scan of what other university data services web pages look like. I reviewed what the navigation was, what the common practice was in terms of content and usability, and it was really helpful in determining what's out there and what our users might be expecting to see based on kind of that data services world. Then I took a complete inventory for the pages that we already had, which greatly assisted in identifying duplicated information and also allowed me to see what pages were connected to what and you know evaluate whether or not they should be, that sort of thing. Then I asked our user experience librarian to provide us with some analytics uh, to assist in identifying any broken links um, and also to help me prioritize the work based on which pages were popular and then looking at which pages were not and seeing if we needed them anymore. Then I also reviewed the navigation and the information architecture in great detail. So the information architecture is kind of the structural design of the website. It helps uh, user, it helps answer things like, is the navigation intuitive? Are we losing users because there are too many hidden links or they're taking too many clicks to get where they need? That sort of thing. All right, so for the work, I would definitely encourage that you act like a user. So go into the web page with a research question. Are you able to find what you need? Um, and where would you expect to find what you need? Those sorts of questions are really helpful in uh, determining whether or not your web page is efficient. Then again, you want to remove any duplication or files housed elsewhere because you might not need them on the web page. You could even just have a link to that content. Then you want to streamline uh, your content based on the analytics, the environmental scan, and kind of the plan that you made. So that is something that is ongoing here um, in the data services team. And then again, we wanted to focus on those accessibility best practices. So ensuring that anyone and everyone can access the content that they need. So here's some more tips and tricks that I found along the way. So mobile friendly is key. It's important to note that many of our users are accessing our web page from their mobile devices. So your pages must be properly visible and adaptable to a tablet, cell phone, what have you. So you can even check it out on your own phone and see how it looks, and then you can make your edits from there. Secondly, uh, you might want to use your sidebar. So we find this uh, is a great method for our users to jump between important content and not to get lost along the way. Everything they need is right on the bar. And then you want to make sure that you run your analytics and check for broken links annually. This will ensure that there's less upkeep in terms of your maintenance, and it will also help you prioritize any new content along uh, that you've acquired throughout the year. You may want to use some page anchors. I find this really helpful for users to navigate to a certain area of the page, and they're very mobile friendly. So if you have a long page that has a lot of content, some anchors at the top would be very beneficial. Then you might want to include some up or top buttons so that users who are down the page can navigate easily back to the anchors at the top. And finally, we love to include a date last reviewed a portion of the web of every web page at the bottom because it allows us to refresh as needed and keep an eye on how current things are, but it also gives users that confidence that the content that they're viewing is as up to date as possible. I've also included some accessibility resources here, so I definitely encourage you to check those out. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Lacey. Um, great overview of that whole sort of process of, of of making those changes. I think that there's a lot of us who are in that situation where we're looking at things and going, right, <laughs> yeah, this, this needs to be overhauled. Um, so again, if you have um, questions um, for, for Lacey, please add them to the, the Q&A. Um, I did have a quick question for you. Do, have you had, I, I realised that that last screenshot you showed had a very recent um, update date, but have you had um, feedback from, from 
um, users or anyone on the changes that have been made? Uh, that's a really great question. So according to like our user experience librarian who keeps track of a, a lot of the analytics, um, having that date there has been seen as something that does build confidence. And uh, in terms of running kind of the analytics every year, she does let us know what hasn't been reviewed in a while. So it's it's a much easier way to flag things that have to be updated. So if you can include it, whether or not it's visible or not, definitely do it. But I mean, as a user, uh, going to a web page and seeing that it was reviewed very recently does give me a bit more confidence in the material. Um, so definitely something to look into if it's possible for whatever platform you're using. Great, thanks. Um, we have a question from Dan Scott. What percentage of users are you seeing coming from mobile devices? I was surprised to see that less than 10% of our users are coming, from, are coming from mobile devices. I would have expected it to be higher. Not saying there's any reason not to use responsive design though. That's a really great question. And I think it's gonna differ amongst us all. I don't have an exact number, but I do know that most of the hits on our web pages are from mobile. So it's just something that is very popular here at Carleton, and it's something that our uh, user experience librarian really advocates that we kind of think about and also test. Um, so that's really interesting, as you mentioned, that the number is so low, Dan, but um, I think you'll see that number increasing, and it kind of just depends on uh the students uh, the users like how they're looking to access it but our number is quite high and it's more mobile than it is you know on a laptop or computer or what have you excellent thank you um well like i said we'll have the question and answers um going for for the rest of our time so if anyone um has further questions please pop them in there thank you very much Lisa. thank you everyone Okay, and our final presentation um, this morning is from the University of Ottawa. We have um, Mackenzie Kaufman and Yu Yong Lee, um, and they're presenting on information management for library IT departments. And excellent, we have the slides, so I'll hand over to you both. Hello, just. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Mackenzie Kathman, and today I'll be presenting our work implementing knowledge management uh, best practices into the library IT team's use of various softwares. Uh, unfortunately, Yu Young Lee, who was the head of library IT at the time, had a family emergency, so she can't be here today. So I'll just try to get by without her. Um, she was my supervisor while I undertook this change management work as a co op student in 2021. Uh, and she was definitely an integral part of that work. So it's unfortunate, but um, so uh, due to the reorganization and staff changes, the team evolved to include new members. And as there was no standard process for documentations before, this made it really difficult for new members to reference one another's work and also led to confusion and inconsistency over what, where, when, and how to document information. Uh, therefore, the team headed by Yu Young considered the implementation of knowledge management a high priority and in response, they hired me as a co-op student from the MLIS program to tackle this issue. Um, just for reference, the three softwares or the four softwares, I guess, that I really worked on were SharePoint, Confluence, MS Teams, uh, and TopDesk. I'll get into that a little bit more specifically later in the presentation, but just to orient us. Um, so based on discussion with the team and library stakeholders and uh, my research of information management best practices for libraries, uh, best practices for IT departments, best practices related to the specific tools they were working with, we narrowed our goals down to consistency, clarity, and knowledge sharing. We wanted to ensure that our expectations for information and knowledge capture were clear and that everyone knew when, where, and how to document information. We wanted to ensure that each platform was being used consistently by all team members and finally, we wanted to see an improvement in knowledge capture and sharing. Uh, the most obvious roadblock for this project was untangling the web of the different systems, practices, and habits. We began with interviewing each team member and asking them about the tools they were using, um, what's this information system used for, what belongs here and what doesn't. Um, for example, what's the difference between Confluence and SharePoint? And what we learned was 
no two employees gave identical answers. Uh, there was a disconnect and a lack of consistency that led to the mismanagement of information objects. So the diagram on the right of the slides, which I'll spare you um, a detailed overview, but it was the final organizational chart depicting the knowledge sharing tools that the library IT department used and how they worked uh, together. Um, this is where we ended up after months of untangling the web. And now I regret not doing a before diagram because I think it would have been really interesting, but I think even looking at how complex this final version is, I think it's obvious how people become confused or are not clear on how or when to use the different software in their day to day. Um, you'll notice the systems are highly integrated and rely on one another. No one can function in a silo and certainly every team member needs to use every uh, platform for different, different purposes. So what we tried to do was clarify how these tools interacted to ensure consistent knowledge capture and sharing practices and to make sure that the connections were clear, meaning any links from one to another were working and the file names match the channel names on Teams, for example, um, and that sort of thing. Of course, I make a note, there's always exceptions. Uh, this is in a perfect world and there's always one or two things that doesn't fit, but this is a general sort of overview and it would be different at every, every department. So uh, now I'm just gonna give you a high level overview of the best practices we adopted as a result of this project. So. For SharePoint, first of all, we implemented a simple semi-automated metadata schema uh, based on folder structure, and it was using SharePoint's built-in metadata functionality. We really tried to over avoid overcomplication by narrowing it down to two essential tags, uh, being document type and library application. Uh, the idea was that so long as these were working well after a year or so, they could always add more tags if they needed. And it's important to note we left really detailed documentation and instructions on how to manage metadata in SharePoint so that when they wanted to do this, they had all the tools they needed. Uh, we also ensured that we adhered to the university's existing retention and disposition schedule um, by creating an archive folder as a waiting zone for documents to be transient. And then after a cooling off period, the archive folder could be reviewed and documents deleted. Uh, and I've included the little chart, kind of decision-making chart for uh, the University of Ottawa that I got off some documentation. Um, as the team uh, was using Microsoft Teams to access SharePoint, we ensured that the SharePoint folder structure was mapped to the MS Teams channel, uh, which meant that things didn't get lost in like a documentation. It was called just a documents folder that was kind of being a catch-all before. Uh, we also used OneNote for documentation per the team's preference. And I think the lesson learned here was to incorporate how the team was already working into the project. Uh, and not to try to work against the current if you don't need to. I believe this helped a lot with team buy-in and adoption. Uh, for Confluence, it's a library facing platform uh, known as the intranet. Uh, we moved internal documents away from there and into SharePoint and OneNote. And we asked ourselves, would the rest of the library wanna see this? And if the answer was no, we rehomed it. Uh, we also implement, implemented site page templates using the built-in functionality of Confluence. So now when a team member creates a page on the internet, they only need to use a template and fill it out with the relevant information. This ensures consistent format and also it helps to save time, which was um, a pain point. Finally, for Top Desk, we created a ticket closing checklist uh, where we ensure the team is following best practices per service level agreements. This checklist was printed and placed at workstations to remind team members of best practices as they were working. And that's uh, up in the top corner there. Uh... So rather than having this be a one-time housekeeping project, the team has integrated these practices to be part of their work routine. Uh, for example, since the project, they started organizing a document mathon every week in June when it is typically less busy for them. And that's where team members work together to update documents collaboratively. Um, these changes positively impact the team's performance, their job satisfaction and technical support for users, which is really meeting the initial objectives and motivations of the project. Uh, these practices ensured consistent services and maintain and maintenance across the team and encouraged team members to collaborate and learn from each other. Uh, they, know now, they now know when to use each tool, where to look for information quickly, and are able to keep track of the history of major changes. Um, so that's all for today. So if you guys, oh, I thought I had a question slide, but I guess I don't. Um, anyway, not important. Um, yeah, so if you guys have any questions, please feel free. Thanks very much, Mackenzie. I, I will say that this, um, as you were speaking about this project a lot, was resonating for, for me, just sort of thinking about um, 
yeah, the document management piece, it's, it can be tricky. Um, so again, if you've got questions, please add them into the, the um, question and answer module there. Um, and I also loved your um, characterization of untangling the web and, and how that can be definitely one of the first hurdles to, to sort of imagining how all this um, could happen. Um, so I guess I had a question for you about the document phone. <laughs> is that have you I like the idea that that's sort of a, a multi-pronged um, opportunity um, but is there are there any takeaways from how how you um, have put that together and how it's how it's really worked well um, as a team that you might want to share yeah yeah I certainly wish you young was here because I was only there for my co-op and then she kind of oversaw these things when I was gone so so that's a shame but um, I guess my understanding of how it's gone is that they've sort of all gotten together and sort of in the same space in the same room. And then a lot of the times I find when you're documenting what you think is just obvious, somebody else might not. So you kind of get the capture those sort of things that get, uh, that get forgotten from the, from the process. Um, but yeah, and I think it's been a really good collaborative exercise for them, but yeah, again, I don't know. I wasn't there in the room when they did it. So that's a little bit of a shame, but. Oh, oh and I, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, also, if anyone had any questions about um, like the metadata schema or how to do the Confluence stuff, if you want to message me separately, my email is there. If you want to go into a little bit more detail of how those things worked, because there was a lot of lessons learned doing that, that I could save you from, hopefully. <laughs> Excellent. We've got a, um, a question here from Huma. Um, do you have advice on document migration to to SharePoint, best practices on how to start? Yeah, yep. Um, so I think the thing to do first is before you start moving things over, really think about the folder structure that you want to use. Uh, if you want to use naming conventions, I would say one thing that I definitely learned was to get all those ducks in a row before, because there were times where I sort of did a bunch of things and then found out that it didn't work and then had to undo. So <laughs> I suggest making sure you have the right structure that you want, although you can apply the metadata to the folder structure after the fact, and it will be attached to documents, so that's all okay. But making sure the permissions are correct. And then also, I think with naming conventions and migrating, migrate a sample. You can migrate a lot of documents all at a time, which is really nice with SharePoint, and it's really intuitive like that. But, doc, you know, move over 10, apply the naming convention, put the folder structure, ask the team how they feel about it, because yeah, you don't want to find out that you've done something a little bit uh, wrong or whatever, and then you have to go back and, and redo hundreds of documents. Um, if I can save you from having to do that, from my experience, then uh, then I'm then you're welcome. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. So I will um, I will also mention that all the slides from these presentations are available on um, are available on Spot Docs as well, and we can. We can pop the link to, to that in the chat. So thank you very much to all of our um, presenters today. It's really great, as I said, hearing all of the activities that are happening happening locally and having this opportunity to share that with each other. So um, that is it for me. I'm going to hand back over to Sabina. Thank you all. OK, thank you. And thank you to all of our lightning talkers today. Um, those are some really interesting presentations, and I think uh, it just shows you how much stuff is, is going on around um, around Ontario now in, in, in all of our different members and all the different services that, that each one offers and, and different initiatives going on. So um, this reaches the end of the um, English language portion of today's events. Um, we do have a couple of presentations that are going to happen in French. So um, for those of you who um, do not speak French. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And a reminder that we will be back here, same time, same Zoom link, 10 a.m. Eastern uh, tomorrow morning, where we'll have um, a panel presentation that I'm really looking forward to. We'll have our annual pet parade, and then we'll have some more lightning talks, and then a little bit of an update from Ocal. Um, but for now, we are going to um, take a few moments to reset our brains to be in French, at least I, I need a few moments to reset my brain to be in French. Um, and then uh, we will start our presentations um, in French. So I will um, pass pass it over to uh, Karen, who's rejoining us to give a 
very short introduction. Oui, bonjour tout le monde. And for those who want to learn French or who feel like, oh, maybe they're not sure, but they want to listen in and, you know, c'est correct avec nous de faire ça. Alors, pour ceux qui parlent le français, bravo, Amy! Et alors, ceux qui parlent le français euh, et ceux qui parlent anglais, je vous dis, dis la bienvenue euh, à cette partie de notre Scholar Portal Days. Alors, euh, euh, voilà, on va être avec Ginsley et Sabina, puis ils vont nous raconter euh, beaucoup de choses sur Scholars Portal. Bravo, oui, Katia, reste avec nous, stay with us. Et euh, on est content de vous avoir avec nous. On espère que vous avez euh, des questions pour Ginsley et Sabina, parce qu'on veut être sûr que c'est une conversation et que cette conversation euh, continue des deux côtés. Alors, euh, c'est ça. Oui, il faut se pratiquer. Bravo, Jacqueline. C'est exactement ça aujourd'hui. Alors, prenez ça pour une euh, opportunité de vous pratiquer. On est dans un espace où on comprend qu'il y a des gens qui essayent de parler français. On essaie aussi de pouvoir aider tout le monde. Alors, voilà. Et je vois que Carlos nous dit qu'il qu a de la euh, famille en France. Alors, si vous avez des questions, bien sûr, vous avez euh, de, le, le bouton Q&A qui est euh, sur la bande euh, en en bas de votre, de votre ordinateur aujourd'hui sur notre Zoom Link. Alors, si vous avez des questions, je vais regarder euh, les questions là et on va, pouvoir, euh, on va pouvoir avoir une bonne conversation. Alors, euh, je, je dis à Sabina et à Kinsley maintenant, euh, allez-y. Merci, Karen. Alors, euh, notre présentation cet après-midi, euh, après c'est bien après-midi. <rire> um, on va euh, discuter quelque chose qu'on euh, qu a déjà euh, discuté un peu plus tôt ce matin, mais avec une euh, euh, direction un peu plus sur euh, les impacts pour euh, nos utilisateurs francophones et nos institutions bilingues. Alors, euh, Ginsley va commencer avec euh, des nouvelles sur euh, le prix Micheline Perso. Bonjour à tous. Euh, alors, euh, Labo Franco euh, est une division de l'OLA qui regroupe les membres du personnel francophone et francophile des bibliothèques en Ontario qui travaillent dans le domaine public, collégial, universitaire ou scolaire et qui ont à cœur la culture francophone. Alors, euh, et euh, le prix Perso, euh, de, le prix Micheline Perso, désolé, est un prix destiné à honorer une personne, euh, ou, euh, euh, à honorer une personne, un groupe, euh, une institution qui s'est distinguée dans le développement de la promotion des services de, de bibliothèque en français en Ontario. Euh, alors, on va juste cliquer une fois pour montrer le prix. OK, ça, c'est le prix euh, qu'on nous a décerné. Alors, le service clavardé avec nos bibliothèques TKR est, un, est, est le récipiendaire euh, du prix Michelin Perso de 2022, remis en février dernier par l'Association des bibliothèques de l'Ontario euh, lors de, la, de sa conférence annuelle à Toronto en février dernier. Euh, et... Euh, ce prix est nommé en, en l'honneur d'une bibliothécaire euh, franco-ontarienne qui s'est distinguée pendant de nombreuses années. Ce prix vise à souligner la promotion du français dans les bibliothèques de l'Ontario. Prochaine diapo. OK. Uh, Clavardé avec nos bibliothèques, euh, avec nos bibliothécaires, est un service de référence virtuelle en français euh, en collaboration avec les bibliothèques de l'Université d'Ottawa, de l'Université Laurentienne, et euh, anciennement du campus Glendon de l'Université York. Euh, nous voulons euh, alors remercier l'Université d'Ottawa grâce, grâce à son in initiative. Euh, le service Clavardé a été lancé en 2014. Euh, nous voulons aussi euh, euh, remercier euh, les universités qui ont euh, fait la promotion de ce service. Euh, par exemple, Algoma. Euh, l'Université Algoma, l'Université Western et l'Université de Toronto qui ont affiché euh, euh, le bouton euh, clavardé, euh, mais le service euh, est redirigé dans le, à, à travers euh, à, à d'autres euh, 
euh, est, est redirigé au service clavardé plutôt, malgré qu'ils n'ont pas d'opérateur euh, bilingue. Euh, alors, euh, nous voulons aussi remercier tous nos opérateurs euh, de toutes les universités participantes au service clavardé euh, qui aident nos usagers dans, euh, dans l'aide à, à la recherche. Euh, dans l'aide à la recherche. Alors, euh, merci. Euh, et on, je voudrais aussi remercier euh, Scores Portal pour sa direction et, la, euh, et le conseil, euh, le, la, le CBUO euh, pour sa direction aussi. Prochain, euh, prochain sujet que je voudrais euh, discuter ou annoncer des nouvelles, c'est euh, le, le référentiel ODESI. Alors, prochaine diapositive. Alors, ce euh, service créé en 2008, euh, développé et maintenu par Scores Portal, euh, est le référentiel canadien euh, euh, qu'on appelle ODESI. Euh, euh, ce service donne accès à plus de 6 000 euh, ensembles de, de, ensemble de données euh, en sciences sociales, comprenant des micro-données et des données du recensement de Statistique, Statistique Canada, des données de l'opinion publique canadienne et d'autres sources. Um, alors, euh, après plus de dix ans, euh, l'infrastructure du référentiel euh, euh, devait être mise à jour. En 2020, le, le logiciel qu'on utilise, qui s'appelle Nestar, euh, a cessé d'offrir de, des, euh, des mises à jour. Euh, alors, euh, ils ont annoncé que ce, ce, ce logiciel sera bientôt obsolète. Alors, en 2020, Scores Portal a... Euh, et la communauté euh, euh, des données de, 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 de la CBO a, a commencé à planifier une migration vers une nouvelle infrastructure, euh, euh, ainsi qu'un qu développement d'interface de recherche. Alors, prochaine diapositive. OK. Um, alors, euh, plusieurs groupes de travail s'est formé. Alors, euh, le but de, de... Il y a le groupe de travail pour le remplacement de Nestor euh, en 2020 jusqu'à 2021. Le but du groupe, euh, de, ce, du, de ce groupe de travail euh, est de définir les critères et les fonctionnalités de base que la prochaine plateforme devrait avoir. Euh, par exemple... Euh, euh, la capacité de le bilinguisme et de d'avoir de, deux deux, inter, deux interfaces pour la la, la, la langue quoi et aussi ce groupe a conclu que Dataverse est, est le la meilleure plateforme qui répond le mieux à nos critères certains critères qu'on a qu'on a aussi envisagé c'était aussi d'avoir que ce système puisse euh, euh, supporter la, la plateforme, euh, la norme DDI, la DDI ou euh, la Data Documentation Initiative. Euh, C'est une norme internationale permettant de décrire les données issues d'enquêtes et d'autres méthodes d'observation en sciences sociales, comportementales, économiques et euh, de la santé. Alors, ce groupe de travail, euh, le euh, groupe de travail pour le remplacement de Nestar, a mené des consultations avec différents acteurs dans le domaine des logiciels de gestion des données statistiques. Um, et aussi, euh, 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 alors, ça. alors, prochaine, euh, prochaine diapo. Alors, euh, je voudrais euh, Quelques nouveautés euh, aux prochaines, euh, prochaines nouveautés. Alors, euh, dans la partie gauche euh, euh, de, de l'écran, ça c'est la ça c'est euh, la page web, euh, euh, la, la présente pa page web de, de Odésie. Et euh, au cours des euh, prochains mois, euh, on, vous aurez la possibilité de, de voir ou d'accéder à à la prochaine euh, euh, interface utilisateur euh, du côté droite. Euh, alors, prochain diapo. Alors, euh, euh, concernant le moteur de recherche, euh, ça, c'est le site web qu'on qu redéveloppe. Alors, euh, 
il y a quelques fonctionnalités du site web euh, qui sont présentement en développement. Euh, vous pourrez parcourir l'arborescence euh, euh, des collections, euh, des différents sujets. Euh, euh, aussi, ce site web a une nouvelle palette de couleurs, alors c'est totalement euh, différent de ce qu'on avait avant. Et euh, vous pouvez euh, euh, utiliser euh, les fonctionnalités de moteur de recherche, comme, comme d'habitude, euh, par exemple, le tri, euh, euh, avoir une euh, liste de euh, la capacité d'avoir une liste de, de données que vous voudrez euh, exporter euh, les, euh, en référence. Euh, autre diapositif. Euh, OK. Euh, on, on a aussi ajouté euh, euh, un autre outil qui s'appelle euh, l'outil d'exploration de données, euh, je pourrais dire, euh, ou l'outil, euh, celui-ci, c'est euh, de, de curation. Euh, alors, euh, mais on, on a aussi l'outil d'exploration de, de, de données pour pouvoir euh, visualiser euh, les, les données, les, les ensembles de, de données. Prochaine diapositive. Euh, euh, cette diapositive est reliée à la euh, curation, alors la capacité d'éditer les, les variables et la capacité d'ajouter ou d'organiser les, les, les variables dans des groupes de variables. Euh, pour, prochaine diapositive. Alors, le calendrier euh, euh, pour cette année, alors... En mai, on prévoit le lancement de la version bêta. Et en automne, on prévoit la version, la production. Merci à tous. Bravo, Ginsley. Merci beaucoup de cette présentation. Euh, Sabina, est-ce que tu veux continuer? Puis on va faire les questions à la fin. Il n'y a pas de questions euh, pour maintenant. Oui, je pense que c'est euh, plus facile de faire ça, comme ça. <rire> Alors, vas-y, Sabina, merci. Merci. Alors, je vais parler un peu à propos de Racer et le prêt entre bibliothèques. Alors, um, Racer, uh, comme si vous étiez ici un peu plus tôt, j'ai um, parlé un peu de ça en anglais, mais Racer utilise le logiciel VDX et um, il se ce logiciel sera supprimé par euh, le fournisseur au CLC en 2024. Alors, nous euh, prévoyons mettre fin de, à Racer comme un, un service euh, en mars euh, 2024. Um, pour um, faciliter la transition de Racer à notre système, le CBUO continuera à optimis optimiser euh, le partage des ressources dans Alma et euh, dans Omni euh, en particulier. Euh, et euh, nous avons euh, beaucoup plus d'informations sur SpotDocs, euh, c'est tout en anglais. Euh, mais je voulais parler un peu euh, à propos euh, du, du PEB en, en Alma. Alors, le prêt entre bibliothèques avec Alma fonctionne euh, très bien maintenant entre les institutions Omni et aussi avec euh, l'Université de Toronto, qui est aussi un, un euh, abonneur à, à, à Alma. Mais la prochaine étape, c'est vraiment d'ajouter des autres institutions en tant que um, partenaires de PEB uh, en Alma. Et um, ajouter comme partenaire, c'est un peu comme ajouter um, une institution à, à votre carnet d'adresse ou à votre liste de contacts. Alors, um, uh, quand on a un, un, un partenaire dans Alma, on peut les envoyer une demande de PEB ou recevoir une uh, demande de PEB. Uh, mais c'est ici que les choses se compliquent un peu, particulièrement avec le PEB, avec uh, le Québec pour uh, le, le matériel en français. Alors, uh, jusqu'à l'année passée, les universités québécoises uh, utilisaient un système uh, Colombo pour uh, leur uh, propre PEB. Et uh, Colombo était aussi, même que Racer, uh, utilisait le logiciel VDX. Alors, c'était vraiment facile pour communiquer entre l'Ontario et le Québec avec les deux systèmes VDX. Mais um, en Québec maintenant, les, les institutions... Um, Québec, euh, le partenariat des bibliothèques universitaires, universitaires du Québec, euh, ils utilisent euh, le logiciel TIPASA, ce qui est un produit d'OCLC. Et euh, il y a un petit problème parce qu'au moment 
à cet exact moment, euh, Tipasa et Alma ne, 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 se, ne peuvent pas communiquer entre autres. Alors, euh, Alma ne peut pas recevoir des, des demandes PEB de Tipasa et Tipasa ne peut pas euh, euh, recevoir des demandes de PEB d'Alma. Euh, C'est quelque chose qui est en train d'être... Euh, euh, j'espère, <rire> en train d'être amélioré parce que les deux fournisseurs, Ex Libris, le fournisseur euh, d'Alma et OCLC, le fournisseur de Dipasa, sont en train de faire des tests de communication entre les deux. Et euh, nous sommes, euh, j'espère fortement que, euh, que cette question sera résolue euh, dans les mois à venir et que nous pouvons acheter les universités québécoises comme partenaires en Alma euh, par le fin de, de l'été. Alors, cela, euh, je pense, euh, va vraiment aider à l'adoption d'Alma, l'habilité d'envoyer de, des demandes de PEB et recevoir des demandes de PEB avec, avec nos partenaires au Québec. Et je voulais parler un peu sur Spot Docs. Alors, Spot Docs, c'est le wiki qu'on utilise depuis 2006. Uh, et nous avons actuellement plus de 7000 pages. Uh, alors, uh, la, grande, la grande majorité du contenu est disponible en anglais seulement, um, et, mais l'interface est multilingue. Uh, vous pouvez changer vos propres um, uh, settings entre l'anglais, le français et uh, bien d'autres langues aussi. Mais un problème, c'est que euh, nous avons quelques pages qui sont disponibles en les deux langues, anglais et français, particulièrement les articles de blog pour euh, le service de clavardage et aussi euh, les, les articles de blog sur Borealis et euh, le, le logiciel Confluence qu'on utilise pour euh, SpotDocs ne permet pas de créer des, lingues bilingues, euh, des liens bilingues entre les deux euh, différentes versions de la même page. Alors, c'est quelque chose vraiment que, que nous euh, voulons améliorer dans le futur. Alors, en raison des changements de, de modèle de licence, euh, nous prévoyons migrer Spotox à un autre système et cela nous donne l'occasion de passer en revue euh, les autres logiciels wiki sur le marché ainsi que de revoir nos euh, besoins et nos priorités. Euh, une interface en français et la possibilité d'établir des liens bilingues ont été identifiés comme des éléments importants. Uh, et nous avons uh, beaucoup plus d'informations sur Spotox et vous pouvez aussi um, uh, nous uh, partager vos pensées sur Spotox, sur les autres systèmes pour organiser l'information avec un sondage uh, d'utilisateurs. Et c'est tout pour moi. <rire> uh, est-ce qu'il y a des questions? Bravo, Sabina. Il n'y a pas de questions maintenant, mais si vous avez des questions, s'il vous plaît, mettez-les dans le Q&A, euh, dans la boîte Q&A ou dans le webinar chat, mais je ne vois pas de questions maintenant. Cette session est jusqu'à jusqu une heure ou euh, 13 heures de l'après-midi, mais j'ai une petite question euh, pour toi, Sabina. Mm -hmm. um, So, quand ACE va être comme ça avec Alma et tout ça, ça va, ça va, être, un, un, ça va être pour nous dire si ce, ce document ou cette chose qu'on cherche est déjà, euh, est, est déjà dans ACE, mais ça ne va pas nous montrer le document. On va encore faire les, les, les autres étapes qu'on fait pour avoir le document? Est-ce que c'est juste ou non? Um, je pense que les détails techniques de cette mm. intégration n'ont pas tout été okay. um, clarifiés, mais je pense qu'il serait un peu comme uh, si votre bibliothèque a utilisé um, Hathi Trust, leur mm -hmm. um, collection uh, Emergency Access. Um, il y avait une façon de ajouté à un, um, un, um, un livre dans, dans uh, Omni, un, un petit comme 
flag <rire> avec un lien qui allait um, à Happy Trust. Alors, nous pensons qu'il serait possible de faire la même chose. Alors, il, il y a un lien, il, euh, on oui. pourrait acheter un lien à ACE, mais il faudrait encore euh, sur ACE entrer votre euh, euh, token, mm -hmm. euh, okay. jeton. Euh, oui, oui, c'est et... ça, c'est bon, jeton. <rire> Uh, et et uh, le télécharger uh, par rapport de, du plateforme ACE uh, et pas directement uh, Domni. C'est ouais, probablement ça. ce qui uh, est plus facile d'organiser de, de, de notre part. Oui, 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 ouais. je comprends. Et c'était juste pour comprendre qu'est-ce qu'on va voir de l'autre côté uh, quand, on, quand on fait la recherche. Est-ce qu'on voit le lien ou tout ça? Mais oui, les mécaniques, c'est pour un autre jour, mais c'est vraiment intéressant. Est-ce qu'il y a quelqu'un qui a d'autres questions pour Sabina ou Ginsley? Merci, Ginsley, aussi pour votre présentation. Hmm. Pas d'autres questions. OK, bien, je pense que vous continuez à une heure. Oh, vas-y, Ginsley, excuse-moi. Ça va, ça va. <rire> Pas de questions. Pas de questions? Vous avez des, euh, des coups d'eau dans la... Dans... Merci pour la présentation en français de Nathalie. Merci pour les présentations d'Olivia, c'est bien. Alors, euh, bravo tout le monde, oui, c'est ça. Alors, on vous dit merci d'avoir fait ça en français. Euh, on espère vous voir, on continue de vous voir pour le restant de la journée et aussi demain. C'est 13 heures, alors je vous euh, laisse continuer avec Sabina et Gensley et les autres euh, qui vont vous donner les, les prochaines présentations. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. OK. Alors, c'est la fin de, de notre jour aujourd'hui. Merci, Karen, pour, euh, pour <rire> toute ton aide aujourd'hui. Euh, alors, euh, nous allons finir pour, euh, pour aujourd'hui et euh, nous serons de retour demain matin à 10 heures. Alors, euh, merci tout le monde pour, euh, pour être, euh, être venu aujourd'hui et euh, j'espère vraiment vous euh, revoir demain. Merci à tous. À demain à 10 heures.